to episode 198 of the F Reality podcast, your fortnightly fix of news from the world of virtual reality. We've got an interesting show lined up for you today as we're going to be talking about the return of Quill in Moss Book 2. We chat with our special guest, Max Weisel, about his latest VR sports archery game called Knock. We have a couple of PSVR 2 news snippets and a VR first-person shooter made using the Roblox VR engine. This is going to be super interesting. You need to stay around uh, to the end of the show for that one. Uh, really surprising. Rounding up this epic show, uh, Zim will be giving us his top picks of releases coming in the next couple of weeks. But for now, of course, let me introduce you to the team and find out what's been their highlight from the past couple of weeks. Also, feel free to share what you've been playing in the chat so we can read out some of your highlights too. So first up, you need to keep your eye on this guy. He was once famously caught trying to steal an Oculus Quest prototype from PAX East in Boston. He's the original VR headset collector. It's, of course, Nathy. How you doing? This was a gag, by the way, because I don't want to... <laughs> now that all the companies are like, yeah, let's not work with this man anymore because he's stealing headsets. <laughs> we can't trust him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I thought for a moment there. Um, I did. I did what I did. Try, you know, at back. It was staged, right? It, it was staged. staged. There was like a security guard there, and then suddenly I thought, like, hey, what it would, would be funny if we because it was the quest wasn't out yet, but you could just see it in this big like display, and mm. then just ask the guard like, hey, you want to just like act like I'm gonna steal it? And it was like he found it really funny. He, he was even saying like, hey, if it's if it's done, just send it to me. I'm like, you're trying to do your job, and then imagine me like doing this funny thing, but then in the meanwhile, actually, someone tries to steal it. <laughs> but uh for some reason it was okay um but yeah no i did try amazing times you know yeah back in the good old that, days. Was a, that was a few years ago now right and the funny thing is my memory of that was uh at pax was after the event they had rift s's and quest ones all stacked up on a cart and uh oh, yeah it was very it was open and the thing is they hadn't even been released yet and we were just That's wanting true. to get our hands on them. There was a whole cart full of them there. And we we're like, please, just give us one. That was weird. I think, I think they like, did like, like list cart. them, right? They list them. And they had all the they like numbers of all them. the... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, we wouldn't have got away with it, unfortunately. Um, yeah. But what you been up to? Any any uh, cool highlights from the past couple of weeks? Um, well... Uh, I could say Elden Ring, but that that that's not really my uh, my my jam. I'm I'm too noob for that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but you tried it then? No, I did not try it. No, it's I, I do okay. watch people play it though. Oh, I find okay. it very intriguing uh, to see them fail. Um, <laughs> it's one of those games where it's like you know you you have to uh, like you have to fail a lot and learn and then uh, progress basically. Uh, that's something yeah. some people are gonna like the throw their controls against the TV screen. Yeah, me. But... Yeah, definitely <laughs> guilty. Um, but uh, but anyways, uh, like right now the like the VR scene seems to be a li little bit <clears throat> asleep in, in that sense in terms of what's you know coming out. It's kind of chill. Um, it feels like every <laughs> it gets more chill around these times. I don't know. Maybe it's mm. because the hype gets bigger and the expectations are higher. Uh, and, and, and that's why it's hard to also then deliver all the time. Um, so I just, I'm just completely like engulfed in like rec room. It's the only thing I'm playing right now. Um, it, it's amazing. I feel like I'm really a part of it now. At first I was like the outsider who just played it once or twice. Now it's like, it's really like they feel like I'm, 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 you know, part of the community. And what yes. I saw on your Twitter was that you've gone gold, right, in terms of yeah. selling items in yeah. rec room, yeah. which is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so the the I mentioned this a few times, right? That I made a gaming desk, a mm. virtual one, um, and you you can sell this in in rec room. So you can make it yourself and then sell it. And um, yeah, I went gold. So there were like so many people who bought it that you get like a gold item. So there are a couple of different tiers of things you can get in Rec Room. You can get a golden hoodie, you can get golden glasses, a golden cape, and you can see by what someone is wearing how much they made. I don't know why mm. Rec Room made this up. It's kind of like a weird flex, but you can <laughs> see like they're like tw like I'm I'm not kidding. They're like like twelve year olds running around, and you can see they made fifty thousand dollars. Wow! Because they they run around with a cape because you know wow. the cape is, and and then Wait, of course it, the tax is, is on top of that. But, uh, then? The, this this specialty cape you can't sell it then. You're no, just... you can't. You can't. It's, next, it's next wow. in the uh, in the in the rec room rally. They're going to have like a Lamborghini there, and you can only get it if you're like a boss <laughs> yeah. boss tier creator in there. 
the, what a flex. Nice. There is the, the I think the 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 guy who sold the most items, he's gonna buy a Tesla soon of rec tokens. Wow. Uh, but yeah. maybe maybe he'll a have real a problem one? where he, he, he a real he's too no, young. not yeah, he won't yeah. be able to drive it for ten years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so there. aside from minting it and making money in rec room, what what's like your favorite thing to do in there? Like are you parkouring or like building um, stuff or what do so you So yeah, so I, I love parkour maps, those are amazing. Um, they sometimes are so hard that people make skip buttons. So if you get frustrated, you have to buy a skip. And some people make oh. money with that. It's crazy. I usually just keep playing until I make it because every parkour is is finishable. Um, but I also like to go to house parties. They're like every Friday there are crazy parties. You have like 18 plus parties for well, you know, adults and stuff. You also have once for 12 plus. plus. Yeah, yeah, no, and they kick. Yeah. They, there's, there's like, like even a guy at the there. entrance. No. There's a guy at the entrance who checks if you are, you know, you have to like dormant. you have to say something what? with your voice to sound if you're. <laughs> and if you so have, you have like, like a, a bunch of like you get kicked out, going like, they yeah, just I'm, judge you based I'm on doing. your voice. That's hilarious. Yeah. Um, and, and besides also just hangouts where you just like, uh, hang around. Uh, I usually go to the McDonald's. It's one of the places I like to go. Um, uh, but it, it's a good in rec room. <laughs> they're amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Hand drawn, I'm, hand drawn. I'm you, they need to do it where you can like buy the pizza in rec room and it comes to your door. Oh, they could yeah. totally do it. They could totally they, do they it. Could. Just partner with trade stream and bam, you can do that. That'd be amazing. Uh, but um, so so what we're doing right now is we're we're um, like three years ago then like Rec Room made an arcade for me and you could get like an item in it. So when you then entered, um, you would get like this arcade jacket. Um, right now we're completely overhauling this room because if a VR like you know when when you play a game a VR game from three years ago it's kind of outdated. Same with rooms, there are like new systems coming out, so the whole thing had to be recreated. It's taking a lot of work. Uh, but it's totally worth it because we can now, for example, play with like uh, more um, lighting and stuff. So the room looks better. We can add more new features in it. Uh, we added a shop so you can buy that gaming desk that I mentioned before in my arcade too. So there's a little spot there where you can go. Um, so that's something we have been doing. It takes a lot of time. Like you would think that maker pen stuff is something you can just do an hour. It takes like a long time, like four or five hours. You did a really small thing. Um, but this is great wow. to get feedback in return and people saying like, wow, you know, this updated room looks amazing. Um, yeah. But the thing that I, I think my highlight of this week, what happened is, so I was in my arcade and there are moderators in Rec Room that are like volunteers. So I could become a, a volunteer moderator, or you guys, depending on your status in Rec Room. But there was a guy in it, uh, in it who was deaf and was a moderator in it. Oh. And then I was like, how, how do you moderate then? Mm. At first, I didn't want to ask because there's maybe maybe it's a bit, you know. Yeah. But uh, he was he was fine with it in the end. Um, but it was interesting. So he had someone with him who checks people and then sends it through. And then I was also like, uh, how do you do it? with like Because hand tracking is still not really a thing. Yeah, he was like, really like hand tracking needs to be in every game. Because this guy was using the chat feature in Rec Room. Oh, but I found right. it very intriguing. I was like, mm. I've never really met so. He also did it, had it in his name so people could see it. But you saw a lot of people who he chatted to who just answered in voice because they just don't think about how that goes, right? Even mm. I did it at the start. It was like, nice room. I was like, thanks. <laughs> I was like, oh, wait, I need to first <laughs> type it, right? But yeah, I found it very interesting that yeah. not only it, someone it, is playing at death, but then also being a moderator doing like something that is usually about people trolling, saying bad stuff and things without mm, like any, it, you can't read any, you know? Can't so, lip read. Yeah, no. and it kind of reminds me of when, um, it was years ago we talked about this, but there was a couple using big screen, um, yeah. having a remote yeah, yeah. relationship and they were using, the, they were both deaf and they were using sign language in big screen to communicate yeah, with each other, even yeah. though it was kind of rudimentary. Um, and yeah, I'd imagine like the deaf community are really like waiting for hand tracking tech to become like viable um, yeah. for them to communicate effectively is, using hand like sign language essentially. Is that is that API already available to developers for the hands to yeah. come into the game? Like, is that I think it is, right? <laughs> yeah, wax, yeah. Wax, wax, like, useful yeah. access to it. Yeah, right. great. Okay, so so yeah. they could implement that if they if it was in their pipeline. Good. 
They yeah. should. Yeah, I agree with you. I think it's like like that hand tracking has been like a you know a huge requested feature of a big screen for forever. Because if you're sitting there watching a movie, like what's the why do you need to hold a controller? You know, you sh it should all just be yeah. uh, intuitive hand tracking UI. What, right? Must be a design thing for Rec Room though, right? Because everyone's walking around with these like blocky hands, and all of a sudden, you know, here's Nathy <laughs> with like all five fingers. <laughs> <laughs> for, for Rec Room, I totally understand because there's so many games involved, and games require you know. Um, triggers and and thumbsticks but um no, that's really interesting uh nathan yeah. so you're kind of spending a lot of time in rec room at the moment yeah 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 and uh, i Very i think cool. i'm like i'm right now i have time to do it it's it's gonna yeah. be kind of sad to leave it when things are you know when uh, let's say psvr2 comes around and things like that but i'm like let me just invest into something else in youtube right now i feel like it doesn't really there's not much going on and i don't want to force mm -hmm. myself doing things that i don't enjoy you know so yeah totally no I, I totally feel the same way about that so yeah i think we're all kind of taking it uh, a little bit easy at the moment okay cool so uh next up this guy loves to break the boundaries of vr and take a little peek behind the curtains always on the hunt for those elusive hidden gerbils <laughs> it's, the one, it's the one and only it's the rowdy guy how you doing, dude? You all right? I'm I'm doing great. I'm doing all, yeah. I'm doing fine. Uh, you know, th we've had our first uh, real day of spring here as well. Like uh, I don't know yeah. if Zim had like a little bit of sunshine, but uh, you know the yeah, temperature has gone up. Uh, today is a bit worse, but uh, it's been nice to see the the snow slowly disappearing and to see you know spring is just around the corner. I know it won't last very long because spring typically doesn't really. Uh, so we'll be uh, in in hot weather soon, I I expect. But uh, no, I've been doing great. Been working a lot this week. You know, there's there's been a lot of stuff going on, um, and I've had. Um, uh, since like like Nathy said as well, like I haven't played that much VR this week, but I have played another game which I which I touched on last episode a little bit. I didn't want to give it away yet because I didn't I didn't know yet if it was really worth my time because it's something that I I typically don't play that much. Um, it was um, a, a flat game that I played uh, with a couple of friends called uh, Divinity Original Sin uh, Two. Mm, it's uh, so it's, yeah, yeah. Do, do you know? Have you played the second mm. one? I have played it, but I didn't get into it. Yeah, so, so I started it, but I didn't like. Yeah, exactly. So, so I, I'm the same because I, I also I, I never get into these kind of games because they take up so much of your time. But since I found like a couple of friends who also you know you know were willing to like spend some time on it, you know, you get like that kind of motivator from other people. And uh, yeah, we we just dove in there, and holy man, that's a great game. Like uh, mm. it's 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 one of probably one of the best games I've ever played, uh, just in general, uh, just because it's so much fun. And that again makes me think, like you know, it would be awesome to see this, for example, being uh, exported to like virtual reality, like we had with with Damio. But then, like mm. the, just the scale of that uh, of that game is is enormous, and uh, mm. it, it would really be neat to see um, a game like that, which is it's it's kind of like a Dungeon and Dragons type of game. Uh, very similar to what you have with Demio. It's only not only in a dungeon, but it's like you know, it's it's a large and open world with a with a storyline that is woven through it. Um, you have a lot of different classes, and you can play the game literally like a like a like a board game D and D for the people who are interested in that or, mm -hmm. or who do that regularly. Uh, but yeah, like things like that make me crave for games like that in virtual reality for sure. Yeah. Yeah, like an isometric view from above, yes. uh, XCOM style strategy yes. game. You yeah. know, yeah. ever since uh, what was it, Code Sync released? Uh, I think it was Augmented Empire mm -hmm. on uh, the yes. Gear VR, oh, and then Augmented it was later Empire. ported to Oculus Go. We haven't had a, like a, no, a and it's such a game like that. In I, VR. I know, I know you like XCOM a lot, and, and I yeah, like I do, it as, yeah. as well. And I'm a, I'm a huge fan of like strategy games in general. I've played like you know almost all of them i think uh, that ever came to pc i'm a huge fan of that and it's a genre that i think that we don't see that often in virtual reality and uh yeah it's it's a shame because even the turn-based stuff like in, in divinity original sin is it's so much fun to do because you need to think about your plans and and damio does a great job at, at that at that as well uh, but it would be nice to see more titles like exploring this particular genre i think yeah like we, yeah. we did had like a certain time where they were pushing it more you had like brass tactics and then you also had yes. another game from vertigo they made also something i forgot the name but you all had like these you know top-down games these strategy mm -hmm. ones yeah. It oh, just you think came about out land, like, Landfall? Yeah, the, Landfall. The twin stick shooter? Yeah, yeah, yeah that was yeah, cool. Yeah. 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 There was yeah, another one, though. PC, the Vertigo one was kind of different, right? Uh, it was the one where you were going around. It was like almost a donut-shaped level. Uh, I and think it was, so. Skyfall? Yeah, like, sky? yeah, something. Sky, sky Dome? 
Dome? I don't know, something like that. It's old Sky World. Yeah. Sky World, yeah, maybe it was Sky World. But yeah, that's interesting. But I feel like Quest doesn't really lend itself for those kinds of games because then you want more clarity, you want mm. better visuals and stuff. And Good maybe point. PlayStation yeah. could kind of pull that off here, you know? Yeah. 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 Fingers crossed. But yeah, Divinity Original Sin, really cool game. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Picking Correct. up a classic there. I yeah. think it was in the sale, Rowdy. Uh, I, I I picked it up in this. That's why I didn't yeah, get um, yeah. uh, Cyberpunk. <laughs> yeah. Of course I did. Yeah, we, we we all know. We all know it's in the sale. I'm a cheapskate. Uh, okay, so uh, <laughs> next up, this guy's got a new addition to his already massive family. Congratulations are in order, as he's now the proud father of his very own little questie. It's oh. the legendary VR streamer. <laughs> Simtok five. Wait, 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 wait. Like Zim space was like, wait, did I did I get another child? Like <laughs> yeah, have yeah, I got yeah, a new yeah. one? <laughs> yeah. I was like, what did I miss? <laughs> I was like, I was like, no, no, you're confusing me with somebody else here. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, your yeah, new yeah. son. Is this your new son? So your new son is called Questy. <laughs> Questy. Oh, God. Show, yeah. show him. Show us show us the baby. Uh, 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 <laughs> one second. I have him up here. Uh, yeah, there he is. Uh, oh, there we go. oh. He's beautiful. I don't know. Does he... you have to, I have to replace my face because otherwise you're not going to see it with these That's true. legs. <laughs> does it? Does it have any hobbies? Uh, falling off of my shoulder into a boiling pit of lava. I think. Uh, I don't know. It's, it's it's like that sickly cute where you like you just want to throw it into a pot and boil it. <laughs> <What the hell? laughs> um, I'm just glad my kids haven't gotten it because they would have pulled the legs off of it already. Like they're yeah, or, or the dog. The dog uh, gets hold of it. My dog gone. is not a chewer, thankfully. Like I'm so glad she's not a chewer. Uh, I'm not going to continue that statement, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> she is something else. Um, and and uh, it's been a fun week. Like I've, I've done in these two weeks, I've done so many different titles um, and we were catching up a little bit before the show because I, I try to keep it limited so that I only bring you the good stuff or the really bad stuff. So um, I'll give you some good stuff. So first off, uh, congratulations are in order. I finally beat Cosmo Dread and that felt oh, great. Oh, well done. Wow. I, I probably put 30, 40 hours into that trying to wow. beat it. And I was struggling a bit. I learned like in like in a big play space, uh, one of the biggest problems I've been having, uh, because the walls are like light blue, the carpet is white, ceiling is white, and the ceiling lights are quite bright. I think the top two cameras are getting like blown out on the quest. Mm -hmm. So it loses tracking problems. And when you have that in the middle of like some kind of enemy battle, bad news. And for whatever reason, um, the, my quest has been quite unstable. Like Cosmodread has been crashing like a lot. And not just Cosmodread, a bunch of other apps are crashing as well. So I might need to do a factory reset seeing as I've you know, filled it its storage three times over. So um, I, I don't know, something's going up with that. Uh, but the other thing that I wanted to mention that I came across shortly after our last show, which I absolutely loved and have gotten into now is, um, I'll try to pronounce this in two ways. Either Les Mills body combat or Les Mills body combat. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, um, yeah. You guys know I like I like I like these kinds of kind of exercise apps and stuff like that. But the thing that caught me out, which I was not expecting at all, is to really like the like dynamic energetic instructors uh, that are in this game. Like what happens is you're doing stuff like whether you're doing really well or very poorly, the instructors are playing off of that the whole time. And they've got recorded dialogue, little, must be snippets, but it sounds really well blended, almost like when you're going through Half-Life Alex, and, you know, the, the, the voice line is, like, matching what you're doing. Like, to the point where, if you remember O-Shape, where you, like, if you go, it's from the same creators, right? So if you, if you put your body in front of a shape that's coming at you, one of the instructors is like, oh, yeah, I like dancing with my shadow, too. You know, there's, like, the moment you do it. So there's no yeah. waiting or whatever. It feels totally fluid. And you end up feeling like you've got not an annoying coach, but like one with a little bit of charisma. Like you, you hate them because they're kicking your ass in the way a real coach does in a gym. I mean, I know this from very limited experience, but I have had some, <laughs> some in-gym experience with, uh, with coaches and I kind of I like them. You know, I, 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 it makes me want to go back. It makes you feel like you got a friend in the game, like to totally. some extent. And then, and then there's one move in that where like, you're like not just uppercuts and stuff like that, but you're like smashing down like you would with a hammer. And it just feels so good, especially when they're kicking your ass and having you do it like rep rep repetitive over and over and again. So yeah, I would recommend that. I mean, it's it's what I wanted Box VR to be long term, but fell off a cliff because they got 
money grubbing hungry for you know yeah. subscription. Wait, so so Mike, you were running this whole like fitness program <laughs> in that game, right? Yeah, you're you're right. Yeah, I, I so I, I I stopped doing that. Like I, I I do need to get back into it. I did stop doing it, so I need to be more consistent and get into it. But I do agree with what uh, Zim is saying in that the trainers in it aren't annoying. Whereas I remember playing the small demo of Supernatural, for example, and oh. the, the the trainers were just super cringe. Whereas sure. these these guys, it feels way more natural and way more fun. Um, so yeah, hats off to Les Mill team uh, for, for making that work that way. But yeah, great workout in VR. Like I did use it for a while. Um, but yeah, I've dropped off a little bit. I have to Pick admit, my bottom. So. I went into, I was stupid. I went into like a 20 minute session straight off the bat. And it was not a lightweight session. Oh, no, no. Like yeah, it just it kicks your ass pretty hard. So if you are and looking you're gonna for struggle. that, yeah, but downstairs the next it was day. a fun struggle. You, like we both did um, black box VR, which is in like yeah. was in two locations. You couldn't do it anywhere else. It was like this weird MOBA, and you were strapping on a Vive or a Vive Pro with this big heavy weight machine. And it was a it was a fun struggle. Like I could, if it wasn't a pain in the ass to get to the gym, I would actually have done that. So if you haven't ever seen that, just look it up. It's actually there in San Francisco. Max, can you pop pop along <laughs> if they're still yeah. open? I, I assume they uh, went bankrupt between uh, between the last two years, but um, yeah, but it's fun. And and there's not that many things that like, you know are fun, are well put together, have great music. I found the music to be great as well. So um, yeah, and yeah check, no it, check it out if you're looking for one because these don't come along that often. Uh, and, and you no just buy it and, and you're done. Yeah, no subscription. Whereas with Supernatural, you pay a monthly fee, which I still yeah. think is ridiculous uh, for oh. for the stage we're at in VR right now. But anyway, I digress. So yeah, good recommendation there, Les Mis. Les Miserables. <laughs> That's what our opinion <laughs> saying in the chat. <laughs> Les Miserables. <laughs> yeah, nice one, dude. Um, so let me introduce you to our special special guest uh, joining us today, the founder of Normal VR and the creator of Knock. It's Max uh, Weisel. Welcome to the show, dude. Uh, any highlights uh, you've got that you might want to share with us? Any stuff that you found interesting recently? Oh, man. I uh, <clears throat> I mean, as, as a developer, I feel like I don't get that much time to play VR outside of work, but... This app I tried, I mean, I can't tell if it's like a hidden gem or if everyone just already knows about this and I'm late to the party, but T for God, I played that on App Lab yeah. and it was unbelievably good. And especially there's like a moment where, you know, first I almost didn't trust it. I was like, I'm going to bump into something in my room. But after you get through a, just just far enough that that kind of just disappears and you you just are completely immersed in it, it was amazing. I... Uh, that just even like in the early days of VR, I remember a lot of people trying to do redirected walking and I, I never really tried a, a demo that felt good or that really uh, felt immersive. And yeah, T for God just nailed it. It was it was so good. It's so Very funny well you said. say that because we, we talk about it regularly on the show, and I think it was really? Zim's highlight on the last show. <laughs> last yeah. show, I went all about it because <laughs> since moving to Canada, I got a massive basement. And it is, it's like eight meters by 12 meters, huge space. Oh, and amazing. I can max out the cell size in T for God. And as you say, it's like, I couldn't tell you which direction I was pointing, you know, and, and to do that for like an hour and a half, especially if you've got headphones and you're totally in it. Yeah. I never once walked mm -hmm. into a wall, but I will, I will raise this one little point. This is a bit of a dark uh, future for us, I suppose, but someone, someone raised to me over Twitter. They're like, you know, at some point it's going to get good enough that these guardian systems, you're trusting them. And someone's going to do a remote kill on somebody someday. Like, you just walk through a glass panel by hacking your headset. And I thought about that. And I was like, it's okay. It's worth the risk. It's worth the risk. I'm going to play it anyway. But it's so good. It feels like holodeck. It's great. Getting behind the wheel of a car or something, you know. Yeah, it's like one of these auto-driving cars. Exactly. It's the same thing. Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah. Looking forward to digging into uh, a bit about normal VR and, and knock a, a little bit later on in the show. But yeah, thanks for joining us today. Uh, if you don't know who I am, my name is Mike, host of the show. But let's dive in and see what the chat have been up to uh, over the past couple of weeks. Yeah. So we, we have uh, Shaggy, Shaggy from uh, <laughs> You Know What, uh, who played a lot of knock this week and also Fox Machine A. Uh, then we have DJ Cat who played a Far Cry VR. Yes, that is also a thing. Almost forgot about that at Meet Space VR in Nottingham. Mm. That should location be somewhere, based only, right? Uh, it is location based. Oh, yeah. yeah, I think you can play it with like, I think it was like six or eight people at the same time if you want to. Mm -hmm. So it's a group thing too. Mm -hmm. um, then we have Hussein who has been playing a lot of After the Fall and some Population One because Population One just got a new uh, new update. 
Um, Reese the King has been playing Nock. Hey, what a surprise. I don't know that guy. I've been playing <laughs> with that guy a lot, actually. Um, and then we have Space uh, Denise, who has been uh, jumping into Elden Ring. And last but not least, Paradise DK, our uh, favorite mod of the show, has been uh, jumping into Space Walkers, which Mike recommended last time. Mm. Yes. Yeah, yes. I did that actually. That was quite. And what, uh, yeah. It's, what do you think? It's, it's good. It's good. It's good. It's worth. Mm. It's worth tracking down and watching. That's all. I'll yeah. just leave it at that. You know. Yeah. Being out and seeing a spacewalk is is really impressive. Like even if it wasn't in VR, it'd be impressive. But the fact that it's in VR is even more impressive. It gives you a much better feeling for what it's yeah. like to be up there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like looking down totally. at Earth, it gives you that volumetric feeling of like, ah, yeah. right. This is what it feels like. And I just know awesome. that I would never do that. Like, even if Elon no. Musk came to me today and said, look, dude, you want a free ticket to space? I'd be like, no. dude, no. <laughs> Take it somewhere else. I'm not interested. I hate flying, so there's no way you'd get me in space. Uh, anyway, uh, so uh, I've got a few things. Um, so I've been playing a ton of Elden Ring. Like, everyone has been playing Elden Ring. I've been getting so into Elden Ring. I'm like 50 hours into it now. It's totally brilliant. I normally hate these kind of Soulsborne type games, but... This has just totally gripped me. Absolutely love it. It's kind of like, I kind of like say it's like uh, Breath of the Wild on steroids. That's what it's like as a game. It, it's, it's, so it's awesome. You would totally I, love it, Zim. That's so you weird. Totally I've been playing it. Breath of the Wild because my wife hated it on, on Switch. And so I'm like trying to like pay it off by playing it on Switch, which is so yeah. weird. <laughs> but uh, I'm, so, I'm getting that feeling. So yeah, I, can't, I can't wait. I can't wait to try it. I won't try it this so, year, though, probably. So good. Year. Uh, also been playing GT7 more, uh, so much so, in fact, that I bought a steering wheel for it and went all out crazy, um, wow, bought wow. like a, a Fanatec, uh, oh, you got a direct Fanatec drive. Wheel? Yeah, it hasn't it's gonna gonna arrived be a while. yet. Uh, that's going to be a while, that's months. Like. They come from Germany, I think. Oh, I so, know, so, so. Yeah. so I would love to hear a little bit more about that because you already spoke about this last show, you know, about uh, Gran Turismo. Yeah. But mm -hmm. I, I, I'm just very curious to like, how do you imagine this being on a PlayStation VR two with the haptics and with the sounds and with the with the yeah, just that whole well, pack of like I, epic immersive stuff. I kind of already imagine what it's like having played like a Seto with a, a wheel set up. You know, it's very immersive. You know, but I think GT has kind of got that accessibility down, and with the console based driving sim you're not going to be having to mess around with settings all the time and you know you're just going to be able to plug the wheel in it's going to recognize it straight away and i think yeah. that's the thing with a lot of sim stuff on pc you need to go into it knowing that you're going to invest a lot of time in the setup process yeah. whereas that's why I, although i've enjoyed those the experiences in the past i put the steering wheel away and then the, the kind of thought about setting it all back up again just mm. destroys any sort of dream of, of doing it whereas with with gt7 I know it's going to be plug and play. It's going to be very easy to get back into it. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm planning to set it up, up here in the office, but because I don't have a, a TV for the, the PS5 up here, I'm actually planning to play it with a virtual desktop and running the PS5 stream through my PC uh, with an Elgato capture card. So I'll let you know when I'm back on the show how that experience There's just uh, one thing goes. I don't understand. So you're saying that it's too much effort to take out the driving wheel and everything, so you just ordered a new one? Or... <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I, 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 I really liked that. I was, I was, I got sucked into it. I was watching reviews on YouTube between the new, okay. um, because the thing is, the the wheel I've got here is for Xbox and PC. It's not compatible with ah, PlayStation. I see, I see. So, yeah, so yeah. that's why I was gonna either it was gonna be the either the new Thrustmaster or the the, the Fanatec. They're both similar prices, but the Fanatec uh, edged it in the reviews. So. That's Fanatec, the way I went with that. Build quality on Fanatec is crazy. Yeah, they look great. It's really good. German. I, I, I used them over at John's. So if you want any tips about that, so, Sibbins has a few wheels. So yeah. is that is that just a wheel or is that with like, you know, the poke and like the pedals and do you have an entire setup like that now or? Uh, it, it's just wheels and pedals. Um, no, the, the, the gear the stick and, yeah. and the clutch yeah. pedal is extra. <laughs> yeah, oh, and you also, need to, you, like you also need to pay extra for uh, an uprated power supply so you have stronger force feedback. So as a base model, it comes with five Newton meters force feedback, Whoa. whereas if you buy the upgraded power supply, you get eight Newton meters. Yeah, so of course I had to go for that one, and, but and I'll, I'll let you know how, how that experiment nerds, goes. Right? Like, yeah, exactly. But come on the show with just... two broken wrists is what's gonna happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'd be like, exactly. so it's so worth it, lads. Um, but the but the real thing the the VR thing I want to highlight because here's a VR podcast after all 
is um, After the Fall, uh, because uh, a few of us in the UK got invited to an After the Fall event, which was hosted by Vertigo Games in London. And they hosted it at um, DNA VR, which is like a VR arcade in uh, Battersea. It's right next to like Battersea Power Station, which is a really cool area, actually. Um, so a bunch of us was there. Um, it's funny, as I was walking from the, the, the train station, I bumped into Paradise Decay, who obviously mods our streams regularly and is like, you know, a huge part of the community. And uh, Doc, Dr. Oculus, they were kind of lost walking around and I went up to approach him <laughs> and Paradise Decay thought I was going to mug him or something. <laughs> but I actually just went, <laughs> I just went and just gave him a big hug. Um, so yeah, it was great to see those guys. Uh, kind of like an elbow in your face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Anna Ribeiro was there, obviously the creator of Pixel Ripped, uh, so it was great to see her. It's been a couple of years since I've seen her. Uh, GT, Beardo Benjo, uh, and yeah, the uh, the Verted Go team were there as well. They were kind of showing, they were showing off some new tracks for Unplugged, which is the hand tracking kind of Guitar Hero game. And they were also showing off the new Harvest run for After the Fall called Boulevard. Uh, it's kind of like a, a mix of indoor and outdoor sections. You've got this really cool section where you're inside a cinema, sort of fighting it out, uh, which is really cool. Um, they also showed off a new LMG weapon, uh, which has this really epic manual reloading mechanic where you have to kind of open the top, load in the, load in the bullets, put the top down, slide the rack, then you're ready to go. So uh, packs loads of bullets, though, so you, you know, you're not reloading all the time. So that was a really cool weapon. Uh, unfortunately, the same boss fight at the end. That's the only real sort of disappointment for me. Mm. They haven't introduced any new bosses yet. Hopefully they add sort of like a selection of bosses in the future which kind of rotate randomly so you don't know which you're going to face off with uh, when you get to the end of the level but um yeah really cool event it's kind of like events like this that really sort of energize me you know meeting up with people and just chatting about vr and jamie from upload was there and it's the first time i've got to meet him in real life so we got to chat as well so yeah it was it was a really great experience i love the vr community i love hanging out with them and chatting vr so uh, that was a really great experience if you if you could do that every second week, like that's that that would be the right balance for me, you know, like yeah. one week of like standard working and then one week of just, you know, hanging out with VR <laughs> VR community that that would be right. It, it, yeah, like it, it used to be like all summer. It's like, oh, Mike, see you in Germany. Hey, Mike, see you in the UK. Oh, hey, Mike, see you in America. I was like, hey, Mike here, Mike there, Mike everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> and everywhere I went, he would touch my head. That's, that's, that's true. That's fact. <laughs> yeah, I, I it's almost totally like I'm a lucky again. egg or something. He, yeah, he you are like my head. My lucky charm, Mike. Yeah, that's why he wears uh, a hat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so that's what I'm yeah, up to. True. Um, so I think I think the LMG and the new Harvest Run will be coming to after the fall in like next couple of weeks. So keep that's your eyes peeled on that if you're uh, still enjoying that game. Um, we don't have a sponsor on this show, but I do have a little shout out that I want to give, and that is to Matt. Uh, from the Quest YouTube channel, BMF, uh, as his family welcomed a new addition uh, today as his daughter Sadie was born. So I just wanted to wish him congratulations to him and the family, and I hope they're all doing well. So, yeah, you've got your work cut out, of you, <laughs> cut out for you for the next few months. Yeah. Don't Time for VR. a third now, Matt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So shout out to Matt. So let's uh, dig into the news then. First bit of news I want to talk about is that VR's most adorable character... And that's little Quill, the adorable little mouse from Moss, is making a return uh, as Polyarch's sequel, Moss Book 2, is coming in a couple of weeks' time. So not that long to wait, at fa in fact. Um, if you're not familiar with the game, which would be understandable because it came out a long, long time ago originally. It has been quest uh, ported to other platforms since, but it originally launched way back in, in February of 2018. And back then when it launched, it was like a PSVR exclusive title. Um, and it was actually this game, Moss, that got me into PSVR because I didn't have a PSVR and I saw all the videos and we were talking about it on the podcast. We were even running the podcast way back then. And I remember what, talking we, we to Nathan. Yeah. I remember talking to Nathy about it and was saying, like, I'm so looking forward to this game. And he was like, you don't have a PSVR. I didn't have a PlayStation either. And then we went to an event. I think it was VidCon in Amsterdam. And Nathy actually gifted me a PSVR headset because he had like a spare one. We had some spare lying around <laughs> somehow. Um, so I went and bought a PS4 and that was the first game I ever played on the PSVR was was Moss. So it's kind of got wow. like a special place in my heart in that that way. Um, but anyone that's played Moss, you know, you, you instantly fall in love with, with Quill and the world of Moss. It's, you know, rich in detail. Uh, you've got this dynamic with Quill that, you know, if you if you if you hold her um, in your hand, you can actually feel her tiny heartbeat through the controllers. And there's little touches like this that Polyarch did that, that made it really yeah. a, like a memorable experience. And I think in my eyes, it's kind of like 
up there with the best VR platformers, right alongside Astrobot Rescue's mm. Mission. You know, it's, it's a really great what uh, I always platforming found, experience. What I always found very interesting about this title is that you don't play as Quill, right? Yeah, that's right. You, you're your own character in that specific yeah. world, a right? Guardian. Uh, you're yeah. like a, yeah. a, a guardian or something like that. And you, like an you play with yeah. Quill, uh, that's right. which is kind of kind of cool. I yeah. think a lot of people forget that that's actually a thing because yeah, this, yeah. this this ghost guardian thing doesn't really have like, you don't know much about it, but you are playing it. But I always thought yeah. it was amazing that you could just like manipulate the world itself too as mm -hmm. the character. So you could mm -hmm. control yeah. Quill, but then also switch to yourself and be like, okay, that block needs to go over there. I'll just move this over there so she can jump to the next part of the, uh, you know, level. Yeah, and I th yeah. and it's a good, like good brawling game too. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, uh, it's not yeah, just it's a, like a like you say cute, but it's also like a really you know badass uh, game to play. Yeah, it's like if you so, gave uh, if you, if you gave Lucky from Lucky's Tale a sword, you know, and well, set him about <laughs> the land, yeah, and slicing yeah, yeah. things up. Yeah, and and you know now's the time to go back and play it if you haven't already. Um, but like I said, it was originally a PSVR title. It then came to Steam, and then later came to Quest in 2019. Uh, since then, we've all kind of just been waiting patiently for this like second book to arrive uh, because it kind of ended a little bit on a cliffhanger. Uh, but like and I said, it was it's going to come. It was fairly short. Yeah. How long yeah. was yeah. it again? Like a few hours. Good few yes. hours. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so this new game, uh, Moss Book 2, is coming out on the 31st of March. Just like the original, though, it's only going to be launching on PSVR with mm. DualShock 4 controller support. Um, so no mention yet of like a Quest port or PC or even PSVR 2. Um, I was actually invited as part of like a, like a press preview event, which they had online where you got to see the game in action. And I think hopefully we're showing you some of the footage from that event now. Uh, it was kind of like pre-recorded gameplay that the developers were talking about and showing us some of the new mechanics in the game. Um, they did say that the new chapter will continue where the adventure left off from the original. So they did say, although it wasn't required, it's probably best enjoyed having played the original because it literally does directly follow on. Um, and they say that it will be several hours bigger than the original game. It will have more interaction. It will feature more puzzles, more traversal, and bigger enemy encounters. Um, and as from the footage, it's very similar to the original game, but I love how Quill is animated. The animation on Quill is just like top-notch. It's almost like P Pixar-level quality, yeah, and it really exactly. sort of brings this little character to life. Um, but some of the new things we got to see in this new gameplay uh, that you, you, know, you might see in some of the footage, and if you're an audio listener sorry but yeah go and check out the footage it's worth checking out uh you see quill uh is able to pick up a, a new weapon in in the form of a heavy hammer mm -hmm. uh which kind of has a dual ability in that quill holds this hammer and can do damage with it but also you as the overseer the guardian can take control of like a spirit version of this hammer and interact with the environment and particularly where you've got enemies that are like wearing armor you as the overseer can knock the armor off which then allows quill to to finish that enemy off so you know, like you're kind of working together through this adventure. And I think that's the, a bit of a theme in this new game is that they want to really leverage the mm. the fact that you're on this journey together as, as a team rather than just playing as Quill so, alone. So it almost feels like you're doing something at the same time. So Quill is doing exactly. her own thing and then you can, yeah, I see. And you're controlling both of these things at the same time, yeah. of course. Um, but yeah, so that's the new hammer. They also hinted that there'll, there'll be other weapons in the game and that you'll have to use certain weapons in certain areas, a bit like a kind of a Metroidvania type game. Um, another new gameplay feature is that the player is able to grab vines from the world and kind of build connecting bridges and also make climbable walls for Quill to navigate the environment, which is something we didn't see in the original game. But again, it's just adding that another level of interactivity with the world as, as you as the kind of like overseer, the guardian player. Um, I did ask them if they had any benefits of playing the game on PS5 as opposed to playing on the original PS4 because, as we know, this is just for the original PSVR. So they, they kind of said that the game will look slightly better and it will load faster on PS5 compared to PS4. Um, but that's the only difference right now. But you were, like the, you didn't ask about the haptics or the, the new controllers, how they kind of, you know? Well, that's the thing. They they didn't even say that it was coming to PSVR 2. They wouldn't I acknowledge mean, the fact that it's coming it's to PSVR 2. Of course yeah, of it course, is. Of yeah, course of it course, is coming yeah, to PSVR yeah. 2. But, you know, they don't want to talk about that right now. Oh, because, I get it. 
you know, they can't. Yeah, I get it. Uh, for obvious reasons. But, uh, you know, no doubt they're working on yeah. PSVR 2 integration. And also it's likely going to come to to PC and Quest, just like the original did as well. So, you know, I'm sure a lot of Quest players are excited for this one. But well, do how you, do you guys do you feel it... about the fact that it's just coming to PSVR 1? Because I think it's quite an unusual move. Yeah. Well, but the timing I makes... I think the reason why it's coming out <clears throat> so they can then, uh, when it comes to PSVR 2, they can just roll through the next, uh, you know, the next gen. That's why they're doing it. But yeah, be, like outside of that, if you're on a different platform, this might feel like really random, mm. you know? Well, I mean, in, in a way, this kind of exclusivity allows them to produce these kind of titles, right? I mean, it's not like uh, they probably get a a lump sum of money in order to develop this uh, if they are exclusive to a certain platform. And like you said, it's probably uh, like a timed exclusive so that it's eventually still going to come to... With with that, I have less of a problem. I think that if it's like an exclusive to a platform, that is more of a problem with me. And of course, we don't know yet if this is indeed the case going to be like a timed timed exclusive. Uh, but I ex- I expect that, uh, considering that the previous game was released on Quest and, and I believe PC as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, we'll I think see. the exclusivity <laughs> window for the original wasn't that long from what I remember. Yeah. So six months or something. And, and yeah, a, lot I, I... Of, uh, a lot of publishers that are a lot of the, the hardware companies that are acting as publishers are doing um, they're switching just to SimShip as a requirement. So I wouldn't surprise me if they're saying, hey. You know, you can you can ship on PlayStation, but it's got to at least be the first uh, the first console that you ship on. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, if they if they if I'm sure if they were going to hold it for PSVR two, it means that they couldn't ship it anywhere else before then. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I, I don't really that have a problem with that because it, it allows them probably to deliver more quality titles. Um, at least, as I, I think, I mean, I'm not a developer, so I don't know, but I can assume that uh, if they if they agree with a timed exclusive they get something returned for that as well yeah but Probably. i think as well like we, we've seen this with fract as well from end dreams you know it was uh you know we were excited for it because we just want to play more vr games regardless of the platform because we t- we all of us own them all um but i just wonder if you know this is going to be enticing enough for people that have like put their headset in the cupboard and they've kind of forgotten about yeah. PSVR until they're waiting for the next gen headset if they're going to bring this out of the cupboard to set it all back up again to to, to play this uh, in the meantime or they're just going to say well do you know what this is great that it's coming I love Moss but I'm going to wait to play this on PSVR 2 when they're likely going to have more features and you know take advantage of the headset's new feels specs like, like eye tracking and haptics and stuff this really feels like a need to me that Polyarc kind of got caught between probably a, you know, a multi-year program release schedule of PSVR 2 and they got stuck in a position where I've got to release. I've got to make some money back. You know, because most games have a curve to them. And in order to keep a studio alive, you've got to get money in the front door every every period, you know, of game development. So even if it isn't their uh, the most adv- adv- advantageous kind of release strategy, I suspect that's the reason why. It's something mm-hmm. more to do with the delay of the <clears throat> eventual launch of PSVR 2 as to why yeah. they wouldn't hold out and wait any longer than it's, this. It's just, yeah, it's just interesting to see if, if, if it hurts to you know bring out a PlayStation VR uh, game before the new next gen or that you could better just wait and then suddenly launch it because there is more. Then suddenly, whoa, Moss 2 is coming you know, to this new... I just wonder, uh, could you re-release it and get the hype going again? That's kind of what I what mm. I'm curious about. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, you won't have the same splash, but we have seen successful uh, replatforming. You know, but I mean, you're in the same ecosystem, but still, they could do something. The, I mean, well, a lot of I, games I think... do anniversary updates or you know do it well, give, the, do a patch and then repackage it just to relaunch on the store so you, you I, do, do that. I do think like Moss got bundled with the PlayStation VR before, right? There was like, a bundle. I think it was part of a bundle at one point. Yeah, yeah. so that, that's it also something they could do where, you know, when you buy a new one, like it comes with the package. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. maybe. What there about you guys? One... Do you think you'll be digging out the old PSVR or do you think you're going to hold off and wait to play it on the new headset or other platforms? I'm going to have to buy a new one first. <laughs> like... Exactly. I'm mm-hmm. in the same position, right? So I need to get a PS5 before. So. Yeah. What about you? Know. They're still not easily available. I have been looking. I've been peeking around, but it's about it's yeah. about a thousand Canadian dollars to pick up a, you know, a scalper uh, console. And I'd like to buy it when the stock is back up. So I'm just kind of waiting. Mm. And that's what I'm doing. Just you know, buy it at RRP. One thing I wanted to say from that video though that is um, 
there's a really cool looking new enemy um a bomber that's like a siege tank from starcraft that like sets up as heavy armor at the front and then fires off units in and so for people who are looking up the kind of the video um, that one stood out to me as like really neat because the characters in the first game got a little bit samey as you were playing through it but i'm glad to see that they're bringing back kind of some really really nifty new enemies in this and the environments look fantastic as you said the the animations of quill itself even the little snippets i've seen amazing mm. like the mm. weight of that hammer and stuff like like the the nuance there the detailed nuance is perfect so yeah. really great how do you feel about this one nathy because i think we're both big fans of moss do you think you're going to wait or do you think you're going to play it on P the original psvr i mean i mean setting it up is going to be a drag <laughs> uh to be honest um i i think i will because uh, we both know that PSVR 2 is not going to come in the next few months. Mm -hmm. um, and right now, as you said, there's nothing to really do. So why not just play this game on, well, old hardware? I'll just take it. And then maybe plan to also play some other PlayStation VR stuff again. Because if you set it up for just one game, <laughs> I'll probably then also revisit some other stuff to kind of, you know, uh, update my knowledge on things for when PSVR... Mm -hmm. But I wish I could just say, I'll just wait and then just play it later. But I'll, yeah, I'll probably play it. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Max? Are you, are you a fan of the original Moss game? I you know, am. It? But, but it, it's funny, like the uh, setting up that dang PSVR headset is such a pain in the ass. I'm, I probably will wait, honestly. Mo but mostly yeah. just because I really get, get time to play stuff anyway. So I think when I do, it's like I, wanna, I want it to be quick. I want to be able to just sit down and get in and, and play it. And so probably this, you know, around the holidays when things are slow at work, I'll go, I'll go try everything and you know, who knows, maybe uh, maybe PSVR 2 will be out by then. That will be sweet. Fingers crossed. We're going to be talking about that um, a little bit later on in the show. But if you are interested in checking out Moss uh, Book 2, like I said, it's coming out on the 31st of March uh, on PSVR 1. So we're only a couple of weeks away now. Um, and I think like Nathy, I think, you know, I'm just going to drag my headset out, set it up with the PS5 and and just play it. Because like you say, what else are we going to play right now? And, you know, Moss is kind of one of those very special games. Um, so, yeah, I'm looking forward to checking it out for sure. Um, but yeah, let us know what you think in the chat. I think a lot of people are thinking about waiting in the chat. That's the general sort of consensus, I think. Yeah. Um, but now let's sort of move on then from Moss uh, and let, let's talk to uh, our special guest, uh, Max. Uh, he's the founder of Normal VR and he's the creator behind the latest VR title, which kind of is being described by many as the Rocket League of VR. Uh, it's a game called Knock, and just released on Quest. It's exclusively on Quest at the moment, but maybe we can ask Max about other platforms in the future. Uh, if you've got any questions for Max, by the way, put them in the chat now, and we can read out a few of them uh, a little bit later on. Um, so, Max, I, I guess the best way to start it, and it's kind of like the way I always ask all the developers that join us in the show, is like, how how did you get into VR? Like, what was your your journey into VR? Were you sort of a developer for flat games previously, or or how did how did that happen? Oh man, that's a good question. I actually didn't come from the games world. I uh, So I had a previous company that got acquired by Google. And while I was there, I was working on design tools. And someone someone came to me and they're like, yo, there's this VR team at Google. They've got this crazy demo. It was like super secret, super under wraps. I was like, you have to try this. And I was like, oh man, I really want to make, I'd love to make design tools for this if this is like a future platform. And so I did some digging, and I've I've got an intro to the team, and and it turned out it was it was it was like one of the original Vive uh, demo rooms, you know. And, but I tried that, and was just like, this is unbelievable. I, I think I played the robot repair demo, and then they had Tilbrush as well, and uh, and I remember playing it, and just being like, this is like nothing else I've ever I've ever tried. And that was kind of the moment I was like, okay, I'm definitely, whatever I'm going to do from here on out is going to be VR related. I don't know what it's going to be. Um, and I didn't, I, at some point just kind of went, I don't even know if anyone knows what it's going to be. And so I, I left Google to start Normal. And, and the goal with Normal was really just to just build stuff, see what, what's actually tight. I don't think anyone, that this was like early 2016. I don't think, uh, I don't think anyone really knew what VR was going to be good at back then. And so, uh, so yeah, so Normal is really just a small studio that I started to, to build fun stuff for VR and figure out, you know, what we think it'll be what people will be using it for, you know, in five and 10 years. Nice. That's awesome. So you said you worked on like, so your, your background was kind of building tools. What, what was that um, that you were working on prior? Yeah. So before, before that, I actually, um, so I, I got my start building iPhone maps for jailbroken iPhones. Like the original iPhone didn't have an app store. 
And so right. this, you know, this was like a hobby when I was in high school. And from there, when the App Store came out, you had all these people who wanted to build apps, but there weren't really many app developers except those who were doing jailbreak stuff. And uh, so I started doing these music apps. I did an app with Bjork and Lady Gaga. And that studio I started basically started making tools to make, to design these apps. You know, we would sit down and, and look at how much time it took us to just iterate. And, and it's funny, one of our engineers came from the games world and was like, yeah, the games world tooling is so much better. And so our goal was really just to build design tools to make it easier to design and develop mobile apps um, to really kind of take a lot of the lessons from the games industry, actually. And uh, yeah, and that's, that's what got acquired by, by Google. Wow, that's awesome. That's awesome. So then you were working at Google for a little while after the acquisition, and then you decided to leave and set up your own company, which was normal. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Totally right. normal behavior. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, so there's a couple of, uh, so there is a game that you can experience um, for free uh, that uses like the normal engine, right? And that's half plus half. And we've we've talked about it on the show before because it's kind of one of those standout free experiences on Quest that's almost like a must try. You know, it's like a really cool multiplayer experience. You can jump in with your friends and you're kind of like these jelly bean type characters. And there's a few little fun games to play. And the one that we always recommend is like the hide and seek one. So basically like yeah. you've got you've got a, a game where one of the, the 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 group will be a giant and the rest will be like shrunk down into miniature little avatars and the 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 funny thing about this thing is that their voice changes <laughs> so the the giant will have this like deep voice or the the little characters will have these like high pitched squeaky voice and basically they just have to run away from the giant and we just had so much fun playing that little uh, demo kind of like experience game in half plus half um so that was built on this engine using the tools that you're talking about right um, so, so how does that work then? Do you kind of like license this engine out? Do developers approach you and do they buy a license or how, how does the sort of, how does that integrate with other sort of VR developers workflow? Sure. So, so it's all, it's all a plugin for unity. So if you're building a, if you're a developer and you're building a game in unity, you integrate our tech to essentially make it multiplayer. And so we'll handle voice chat, we'll handle synchronizing all the avatars and things like that. Um, and it, wor it works similarly to any any kind of like hosting software. You know, the you can download the developer kit for free. You can integrate it for free, and then you just pay us for how much you use it for bandwidth and stuff like that. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, the thinking there was well, really it started because uh, uh, some of the first prototypes that made it normal were multiplayer. I was actually talking to Patrick from the Tiltbrush team. And then I was like, Patrick, you know, what What are you excited about in VR? And he's like, co-presence, just being in a space with someone. I was like, that's all I want to try. And I made a demo. It was just like you had a little cue for your head and hands. And uh, and we hopped in. It was just immediately, you know, you've all experienced this now, but just that, that feeling of being in the same space with someone was absolutely mind-blowing. Um, and so, yeah, so the goal with, with Normcore was really just to make that easy for other developers. And, you know, if somebody makes a successful title, then then we get some money coming in. Originally, it was like, let's not put all of our eggs in one basket and make one title and, and potentially, you know, have the studio go, go under if it doesn't do well. But, uh, but, yeah, now we do a little bit of both. So Normcore kind of funds us doing uh, these other titles of our own. That's really cool. Can you tell us about any games that use um, Normcore as their sort of foundation Ooh. for multiplayer? Or is that kind of like super secret? <laughs> it's, it is secret, but I can talk about the ones that have have mentioned it themselves. So the, the sure. two off the top of my head are ProPut is or Golf Plus now is uh, uh -huh. is using Normcore. Um, Gym Class VR is using Normcore. I think uh, I'd, I'd have to, I should really build a list of who I can talk about, but um. That um, one other, I mean, the, the, the one I also can talk about weirdly enough, although I don't know if they've released it yet, I can't talk about what they're doing, but, but funnily enough, Unity uses Normcore for a lot of their projects internally. Cool. Really cool. cool. That's so awesome. I was going like, to yeah. a comment there on Golf Plus because I've been playing the last three, four weeks with my dad every Wednesday we get together. We were just hitting Wolf Creek recently, but like the multiplayer aspect there is, uh, is great. Smooth, slick, doesn't have a hitch. So, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well done. So I, I guess like you take all the pain out of it because you're, you're hosting the servers yourself. Is that right? Yeah. So, so yeah, normal hosts all the servers and, uh, and yeah, ideally, you know, you're a small indie dev, you don't want to run that stuff anyway. Um, yeah. and we also, we get, you know, we get deals with cloud providers cause we run, you know, we're running so many apps that we can, uh, we can essentially charge you what you would pay Google cloud anyway. 
mm -hmm. except you're also not having to do DevOps or manage it. It's uh, ideally it's it's really meant to be something that's that's just more affordable and, and a better product for for any indie. That sounds awesome. And like, forgive my my uh, you know like lack of understanding around this topic, but like, is there any competitor in the VR space, or what's the alternative? Like, you just have to build it from scratch as a dev. Yeah, I mean, the, there there are there are some alternatives. I think Photon's probably our biggest alternative. They're, they've kind of been in the space a lot longer than we have, but they're not as VR focused. I think when, right. out of the gate, we went okay, voice chat and low latency voice chat is very important for VR. Um, but Photon's the only one that I know of that's hosted for you. There's a lot of other um, there's open source uh, projects like Mirror. Uh, Unity has Unit, and uh, and I think they have a new ML API, but those are things you have to host yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and that can be really tough. I mean, I, like I think the, the worst thing that can happen is you launch and you know every, everything goes down at launch because you can't handle the scale. And it's funny, I mean, that happened to us with Knock. We were, we, but it wasn't actually a norm core. It was, a, I mean, we, we were trying a new cloud provider and we took the cloud provider down which is pretty wow. wild. So in the in the middle of launch, <laughs> I had to switch us over to Google Cloud. So you know, shout out to Google Cloud. But uh, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, ideally, you know, I, I I don't take those risks with our other Norm Core titles. All that stuff's tried and true. Um, you know, Knox running a special version of Norm Core. It's going to be the next version. Um, but so we're running it on. Uh, it's got some new servers. There's some stuff that's in development. But uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think. Even that little blip, we were out for I think an hour or two, and even just you know you start getting those bad reviews and you're watching your average go down, and the Oculus Store doesn't ever get rid of them. You can push new versions, and and like some app stores, they'll only show you kind of the reviews for the latest two or three versions, mm. but um, and so it can it can kind of be the kiss of death if you get uh, if you get below a certain rating, Oculus will stop showing you on the store altogether unless people search wow. for you directly, and uh, and so uh, yeah, so I I think. The, the main reason a lot of indies use it too is just you can launch and know it's gonna it's gonna stay up like the amount of traffic we're already handling is is pretty high so yeah so was half plus half like the kind of like showcase of what normcore could do as because that was free right you that was released as a free app was that kind of like a showcase of what that that can do in the background or was it was it another idea or just you just wanted to throw something fun out there sort of so so half an app is actually the culmination of a lot of things we did internally at Normal. So when Normal first started, I was living in San Francisco. I wanted to move to New York. I didn't want to sign a lease on, a, on an office. And so everyone just started working remotely. And what kind of happened naturally is uh, with the early versions of Normcore, someone would make a prototype, they would drop Normcore into it, and then send the build on Slack, and we'd all hop in together and talk about it. And it was so much easier to get feedback that way, because rather than sending a build and saying, hey, let's hop on Hangouts you know, after you try it, you could just hop into multiplayer VR and be like, OK, what do you think about the design of this? And like everyone would have a copy of the object. But, um, but so that turned into an internal app called Normal Chat. And Normal Chat was, that's where Wanda, the avatar from Half and Half, was created. Uh, Right. It was a space for us to. We did all of our meetings in there. We did our standups. We can. You could import any Unity project into it, and uh, and we also had like support for Poly, where you can import three D models and stuff. Like even the um, the you had mentioned earlier the the different size avatars in in mm. uh, hide and seek and the voice changing and stuff. That's actually also from normal chat. Uh, at some point, you could take any three D model. And you could teleport onto it, and you'd be tiny, and then you could fly it around, sort of like a little drone. <laughs> <laughs> and and someone's like, oh, what if we what if we change the the pitch of the voices too when we when you do this? And I remember one day being I was a little late to stand up and I, I show up and I just see like a I don't know if you all remember there was like a pair of hot dogs model on Polly, and um and basically three little avatars with tiny tiny voices just fly by me on a pair of hot dogs, and uh, it was just it was just like a fun space for us to for us to check in and and talk about what we're doing and. Um, and half and half was sort of, sort of, uh, uh, really just an idea to bring all that together and be like, what is a good, what's a, what's a space I want to spend time with people in? I think that it's maybe a little, it was a little too early. I think when it came out, most people didn't really know someone. They, their close friends didn't have VR, and even still, you know, we're just getting to that point where a lot of my my friends outside of tech have a quest. But I think that, um, especially like the the swim world and stuff, like. That's a space that I go to just catch up with friends. I'll have friends on the opposite coast, and we'll hop in there and just just kind of float around and talk. It's really like the way I describe it is sort of like the uh, 
like going to the park or something, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, it's not a game you're trying to be, it's just a catalyst for conversation. It's a place for you to just be able to have a conversation without any awkward silences or anything. You know, there's no schedule, there's no agenda. Um, but yeah, I mean, really it was just, it, it is just a, a demo of kind of the, some of the research we had done and some of the things we found that worked really well in VR. Yeah. Um, well, totally. well, it's, it's kind of... So go on, go on, Nathan, go on. Yeah, what I find so interesting about Half Plus Half is like this seamless uh, transition of you hopping into it and then suddenly meeting people in a VR space that you never knew even existed in the first place. Because we have played a lot of games and, and experiences in the past where you need like uh, you need a code or you need to do this or that. And with Half Plus Half, it was like it was like instant. There was not really a tutorial. It was super mysterious. And then suddenly you're in this hop with people running around, and you're like, okay, here we go. And you don't get annoyed by going back to your quest screen or having to do this or that. And I just like that where you just start a game. And then you're in it, and you don't have to worry about anything anymore. It's just have fun and, yeah, explore. Yeah. Yeah, it was kind of one of those experiences, like when my dad, um, could you say about other people outside the tech bubble buying quests, and, you know, both my dad and my brother bought quests, and they're not really tech or gamers. Um, but I was able to jump in and, and play half plus half with them, and like you say, we were swimming around, and it was one of the first VR experiences he got to try, and I, I think it was so awesome you know it'll always be a, a memory for me like swimming around in this great big ocean and just chatting to them both about stuff because you know covid was happening at the time we couldn't meet up in real life so it was a great alternative to catch up with each other so uh, yeah i think you did a great job in half plus half in in showing that you know this is what you can do in social vr but also this is a great showcase of what our company can deliver as and you know for you as an indie dev if you want to make something similar yourself so then how did that kind of transition that, just because uh like a big, actually I haven't really told many people about this, but yeah, a big part of that wanting to be able to be in a room with someone remotely is I used to, I used to just talk to my parents on the phone every weekend. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, when I moved, when I moved across the country, it was like, it's, it was nice to catch up on the phone, but all I wanted really was a space where I could just spend time with them and just hang mm. out. Like those, those are the people where, you know, I think, I think there's a lot of people who are afraid of you know, VR is going to replace all the hanging out in person or it's going to, everyone's going to be stuck to a screen. But I think the way I look at it is it's great for the people you can't hang out with in person. And it just, it feels so much more intimate. It's, it's, it's going it's to enhance lovely... that. Uh, it's going to enhance that being together. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's not going yeah, to that's replace exactly it. what it gives. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. what it gives to me every week. You know, I don't get a chance to be with my dad and because of rules, like I can't be coming and going from the country. It'd be cost me two grand to pop, you know, so being able to do that and just hang out and play golf, like it's mad. Um, yeah. Amazing. So, so yeah, if you want to check out half plus half, go and check it out. It's free. Um, I think it's, it's on quest and steam, right? Is it on steam as well? Uh, it's on, it's on, it's on the Oculus store for like, you can, you can play on desktop, but it's not on steam. Right. right. Yeah. On the Oculus store. So it's free. So definitely go and check that out. So then how did this, uh, sort of idea of knock come about and what was kind of the journey from half plus half to, to knock? It's a good question. Um, I mean, I mean, Knock is, is a love letter to Rocket League, right? It's a there's no it's no secret that it's that it's heavily inspired by Rocket League. I mean, um, so coming out of half and half, uh, I mean, it was, it was interesting when we f when when I first pitched half and half to Oculus. This was um, we had the we had the the Quest dev kits back when they were called Santa Cruz, and they didn't. Uh, they weren't really positioning as much of a game console. Like they really, they were kind of thinking of it as just a general purpose computer. And so our pitch to them was, this is going to be a space where you can hang out with people. And it's, it's going to be an addition to maybe some of the more professional things you do on this, on this headset. And maybe about halfway through, I think their strategy had changed pretty significantly. There was like a reorg or something, but they just went all in on games. And it was like, games are where people are using this is where we're going to make money. Um, I think they still have these other goals, but I think just in the short term, they went, let's go for games. And so by the time Half and Half came out, it almost like didn't quite fit. So that's like we launched on a store with only other games. And uh, and I think that after that, we went, OK, uh, we've been we've been making VR stuff for a while. We've seen a lot of games that have come out. <clears throat> you know, my favorite uh, like desktop games are these like competitive multiplayer games the things that you know the games are, sh are short but as soon as you finish you just want to play another one and uh and so i was talking with our team a little bit about it and 
uh, and we went, okay, why don't we try and take, uh, I don't know if you all played Starball in, uh, in Half and Half, but um, it'd be interesting to start with, start with that and just see, like, is it possible to turn this into a standalone title? Um, I'd also toyed with this idea of turning hide and seek into a standalone title, which is something I, I'm also still kind of oh. curious about. But right. maybe not as like a competitive sport. But uh, it's funny because like you know, then I think shortly after that, Among Us blew up, and we're like, okay, maybe <laughs> maybe this would have actually been a great a great title. But um, but so we started just uh, looking at at pl- making something kind of similar to Rocket League, and our our designer Dave basically took Starball and went, what if you know, what if we tried a bow and arrow? and put the bow and arrow into it and we had a version that was just single player there's no multiplayer in it yet and that already felt pretty good and uh and we um we really just sat down and said okay let's how how can we make a playable version of this as quickly as possible and we this is maybe my man the timing on this is getting kind of fuzzy but i think we spent maybe the first year just like just like working on the multiplayer for it this is when we realized we had to make a new version of norm core for it just to get something that uh that can be that low latency and that fast paced uh, you kind of have to do a different uh, a different technique and once we got that working so that i think the first playable version was around actually almost exactly a year ago and uh um and it's funny because it it when I think about the title, I'm like, oh, it must have been as fun as it is now, but I, I know it wasn't. Like, I know we played it. I hopped in with a few friends of mine, and and they were like, okay, this is cool. This maybe has some legs. Like, the locomotion didn't feel quite right. You had infinite arrows, and you couldn't jump. And so people, what we found is everyone just kind of stood in front of their goal and just fired off arrows, you know? No one really moved around. Um, but we started play testing it with friends, and, and people were like, you know, maybe you should limit the arrows, and then people have to run around to, to pick them up. Uh, and then around summer of last year, we started doing an alpha test. And that was me going like, you know, with half and half, we didn't really show it to anyone until it launched. And even the launch day, we're like, oh my God, there's so many obvious things we need to get in here, like high fives. And I think even the the home world where all the people were, we didn't have those uh, ghost avatars yet. And uh, we just went, oh my God, you go to this space and it's just totally empty. <laughs> like mm-hmm. when you're when you're building with your team and you know you're just inviting people to your party, you didn't really realize that was missing. Mm. But uh, but at launch, we're like, oh my God, like the whole point of this home world is to be here with other people. Uh, and so we we threw that in pretty quick. But um, but knock was interesting because I went, if we're gonna make a game that's fun, we have to play test this with people so that so like we basically know it's a hit before we launch it this isn't really a a concept you can iterate on in public because people are going to get good at whatever you put out and if you make any big changes they're just going to be like i'm I'm done with this game and so uh i had actually uh uh posted a gif to reddit and i and i think the i forgot the caption was but it was it was very low-key didn't mention the name of the title i think it was just like hey i'm working on a prototype anyone want to try this and just everyone who replied, we just added to a Discord and got people playing it. And then uh, I think we had about 400 people in it, but about 10 of them were really playing it on a regular basis. And we just spent six months working on it with them. Just just any time they're like, ah, this doesn't feel good, or this doesn't feel good, we'd try and kind of tweak the mechanic a little bit. Mm. And um, yeah, that's that's kind of how it came to be. I think I've met nice. some of those players who must have uh, <laughs> started with <laughs> oh, the, yeah. the skill gap already, like out the gates. <laughs> yeah. And the first week or two has been pretty, like, there's some really fundamental things. And this is where I want to pick your brain, because I picked up stuff playing with other people. Uh, But I'm curious what your tips are, because one of the things I didn't know was when you land your arrow on the ball, you get an extra shot, which means there's this, like, rotating cycle of you want to fire, almost rapid fire, but you want to also be accurate. Because if you miss, you have to go and obviously pick up some beads and and load up your bow again. But um, I, I found that out and I was like, that's just transformational. That's so different. So what are, what are your tips that you think that people new to the game don't don't oh, quite man. know? I mean, you, you touch on a big one that I tell people is while you're working on your accuracy, just try and be close to the ball and hit it often. I think that um the, the flip side of that is that if you're hitting it often, the other person's probably missing often and you're going to drain them of arrows, which is just a... A, a really really good skill. Um, I think the other one is uh, if is you can be really effective at kickoff if you hit it twice in a row. It's almost it's really hard to defend against because the first hit, you know, you you hit it in their direction and they're kind of getting ready to save it, and that second hit just slams it in before they they have time to react. And um, and really the only way to 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 counter that is to get your defensive hit in before they get that second shot in. But um, yeah, I mean, and, and the other thing is really just just 
play for for improving your accuracy. Like people in alpha, myself included, can can pretty much hit the ball from anywhere on the field. And it's a uh, yeah, I mean, it, it sounds kind of wild, right? And and even, like, I think while working on the game, I didn't think that would ever be possible. I just almost was like, I don't know if the controllers are accurate enough, but it, it, you can get to that point. And um, and then what's interesting is uh, is your position on the field is more about hitting the ball quickly. Because I can, I can hit it from my goal, but my arrow takes so long to get there that, it, it you know, you can probably hit it out of the way first. And this whole meta opens up where especially when you're playing doubles or triples, like you, uh, you are thinking so much about where you are on the field and where your, where your, uh, teammate is. Cause even, um, there's this, this guy who's kind of a legend from our alpha named Crow. And, uh, and he became a legend cause he, uh, we started play testing. He got in a little bit before we posted to Reddit, like two weeks maybe, but he got, he got pretty good. And then we added a few hundred people from Reddit and every time they went up against Crow, they just got destroyed. And it's, it's funny because he's like the nice, he's like the nicest guy ever, but uh, but everyone was like afraid of him. Everyone's like, oh my god, I do not want to get mashed. And like, and we still had the we had the skill based system and the leaderboard and all that. So people in the alpha were really trying to climb the charts, and it was sort of like you know you knew that if you went up against Crow, you were gonna lose. And even I think that where the where the real legend started is I was number one for a while, and then Crow beat me, and I could not beat him for like three weeks. Wow. And uh, and so he was he was number one for a while, and I, I to the point where I was like I was like fit, try try to get my work done quickly so I could go practice <laughs> and just get better and so I could so I could beat him. But uh, um, I forgot why I was so as, talking about. So, so has anyone beaten him since, or are there players that have like surpassed that level even already, it's, or did you see maybe or? I, I don't know. So the last two months he's been pretty busy and hasn't had time to play very much. And so in that time we added another person who I only know by the name of Jomo Cakes, <laughs> who's I think number one on the leaderboard right now. And wow. and he got good really quick in the alpha. And then uh, it was funny when we launched because uh, so so actually I got COVID the day before our launch, which oh. was brutal. <laughs> it was it almost knocked me out. And I uh, and so we launched. You know, we have the server issues, get all that stuff sorted. We're on Google Cloud. And then, you know, it's like almost midnight. And I'm like, okay, I'm just going to play one game. I just want to make sure everything's good. I want to make sure, like, uh, uh, everything's working properly. And I hop on and I just, I get matched in a 1v1 with Jomo. And I was like, oh, no, I don't have any energy right now. I'm going to get destroyed. And uh, and we hop on and I'm talking to him. And he's like, he's like, yeah, I have not lost a game yet. And I'm like, okay, well, get ready. I'm, I need to. I think I was number one on the leaderboard at that point, and I was like, well, I'm going as hard as I can. I'm not losing my number one spot. And uh, yeah, he he beat me. I think by like one point. I'm still I'm still mad about it. But it was funny because then like two days later, uh, I hopped back on and and I got matched with him, and he's like, still haven't lost yet. And uh, and I beat him. I like I think in overtime by one point. It was so it was so close, and he was like. I was like, yeah, I'm so sorry to, to, to crush your winning streak, but I got to get my spot back. And it's like, yeah. if I had to lose to anyone, I'm glad it was you. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I, th I, th I, That's think, awesome. I think it's so important that as a, as a developer yourself that you enjoy the thing you're making and then also playing it yourself because then, you know, it's so important because then you understand also what people want. So you don't necessarily always have to have people give you feedback because you also play it yourself on this like level mm -hmm. where you're like, oh, wait, this this could also be great, you know? I think that's funny very, thing, very important. The funny thing about that is like our multiple people on our team are good at are good at the game. And like uh, like and we even use like different lo different locomotion systems and stuff. But uh, when we first added the ability to like jump and pull yourself in the air, I could use it to destroy people on the team. It was funny watching everyone be like, I think we should limit that feature a little bit. And I was like, no, you guys are just, uh, you guys just don't want to lose. <laughs> and, uh, and it's funny how like, we uh, certainly like playing the game has helped us, uh, you know, inform like what features matter and really understand like what makes the game feel good. I think you can, you can do things to make it feel more balanced or to make the matches feel more balanced, but if they feel kind of cheap or like an artificial limitation, um, like at some point, I think we had a bow with a with just like a cooldown. So if you if you fire too much too many shots in a row, and it's sort of like you feel kind of helpless while you're waiting for it to 
for it to, yeah, I guess, warm back up versus when you're picking up arrows, it's sort of like, oh, snap, I need to go pick up an arrow. Like there's something you can do about it. Mm. And I think that uh, a lot of like small decisions like that were uh, uh, easier to make when we all play the game. But certainly there, there's some contention around some features because they would give other people on the team an advantage. Like uh, mm. our designer, Dave, is just unbelievably good at shooting from a distance. He's probably a better distance shooter than I am. Um, but yeah, so he, he hated that I would, I would jump up and I could like dunk the ball down on him. But, uh, and I was like, no, we need to keep that. And he's like, well, you know, I, I, I want, I think we should, we should nerf it, but also I really want to have these curve arrows. Cause his whole thing is like, he basically wants to sit on his side of the field and curve the arrows around. And, uh, like we had, we have a prototype where you can, uh, there's, there's actually two versions of curve arrows that we're messing with. There's one where you steer them in air and the steering gets weaker as the arrows in air longer. And then the other one is, uh, is basically as you, as you twist your wrist, it kind of introduces a curve, but it's oh, fixed. That's, as nice. it that's really, really <laughs> cool. And that one, that one's pretty cool. Cause you, I, I really want it to be a mechanic that, uh, like, uh, e sort of like each 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 piece of the mechanic is something you learn after you've mastered the previous one. So first you're just trying to master shooting, then you're kind of doing locomotion, and then there's those cubes. Yeah. And so uh, I don't know everybody just froze for me. Okay, cool, we're back. Um, but so then there's then there's the cubes, and the cubes are interesting because they're they're really hard, but once you kind of get good at them, they're they're extremely effective. Um, for redirecting shots, for making saves, like uh, there's there's a lot of crazy things people do with them, and I kind of see curve arrows as the thing you master after that. And um, the the thought is like if you if you turn your wrist a little bit and you have just a curved trajectory, you can hit the ball to the sides. And I think for like hitting it hitting the ball around someone, I think it'll it'll add a lot of depth to the mechanics. So, uh, but yeah, but there's there's always a lot of I, w I wouldn't call it drama. Everyone, everyone's very respectful. We, you know, I, I like we all love working with each other, but there's definitely like tension because you can tell yeah, we're yeah, so yeah. invested. So, yeah. so <laughs> I, I, I do see, especially in the chat as well, that there's a lot of people that have really embraced this game. I, I saw that, for example, <laughs> D1360 VR said a five star uh, score on Quest. Whoa. Uh, man, congrats! You knock it out of the park, <laughs> which I thought was a great one. I was also wondering myself if you lose your spot on the on the leaderboard, is that the last day that the game is online? Are you taking it down then, and so that no one can? <laughs> <laughs> no, I've already lost. It. I think I'm like number four or something. Oh I, no! Um, wow. I am um, when and like I uh, I just I've been we've been so busy with the launch and then I was and I was sick like oh that's I didn't have your time excuse to yeah yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, trust me like this this week if I have any downtime at GDC I'm gonna be I'm gonna be trying to clop my way back to the top for number <laughs> one and uh, yeah no I um uh, I know it's coming like I think the reason I'm trying to keep it so long is because like I know there's gonna be some kids who in a month will just be able to destroy me and. Short of short of like quitting my job to play knock full time, I'm I'm not going to be able to compete. <laughs> I, I do think it's great to finally have like a sports game on Quest that is competitive but can also be played casual, has a good matchmaking system because we uh, like a, a, a few months ago when like Larsenauts came out this game they they made the game but they didn't think about the matchmaking system and that was resulting into people who never played the game would end up against people who were like playing it for like hours upon hours upon hours mm -hmm. well here it's like you like as far as i can experience it when i jump from 1v1 or 2v2 or 3 it's like you of course have different rankings but it it, it feels very balanced and that yeah. makes it fun you don't want to be you know playing and then it, it's like they just destroy you like i've, I've mm -hmm. played so many vr games mm -hmm. where you're like concerned about having not played it for a few weeks and then when you jump back in yeah. like uh, like with knock as well like i sometimes play on a monday but then it takes like three four days before i play it again but then i can just jump in and kind of catch up with it because the system does its thing and keeps, I, th I keeps think that's important as well like uh, like i think it's like a key ingredient of like a good game is that it's like it's easy to play but hard to master right that's like the, the kind of I mean, yeah. I, I I play a lot of Age yeah. of Empires, which is one of those games as well. It's like easy easy to play, but it's like hard to master. And that's like what what has brought that game, you know, so many players over so many years. So I think it's great that you have those like core concepts in there of like, uh, you know, making it easy for beginners, but have also value there for people to spend more time in there to become yeah. actually better and develop a skill set. So, so what and, I, and found I think the matchmaking will only get better too. Like, uh, like oh. early on, the probably launch day was brutal because the matchmaker just didn't know what anyone's skill was. So there were people coming in who were unranked who just have who have been playing for six months. 
but um, but over time, it's it's really good at figuring out how good you are. I mean, for what it's worth, it's a it's a it's it's a modified version of True Skill, which is like pretty standard for games like this, and it's like the same thing Rocket League uses. But it's um yeah, it's that was a big thing for us was like early on, like we kind of learned this through through Crow as well, like playing against someone who's way better than you just is not fun. Yeah. But as we have more players, the closer the matches to being a fifty fifty you know skill match, the uh, uh, the more, yeah, you know, just the more fun it is. Yeah, the more, like, the closer the games are, the more you want to just play yeah. another one. A hundred percent, yeah. I wanted just to mention real quick was um, the soundscape in the game. Like, this is true for Half and Half as well, but the feeling of, like, a highly polished, like, soundscape, just that the sounds, every little menu interaction, um, even the fact that from almost like a user interface and a user experience, like, from the beginning, how do you interact with the game? Well, you have to be smart enough to kind of cop on, oh, I've got to use the arrow to shoot the thing to get into the game. And I, I love that kind of um, slipstream of, I'm not going to have to throw a tutorial in your face necessarily. You know, you can you can get in, you can pick up and go. But the sounds, the sounds are just wonderful. I don't even know how, where, you know, for the sound of picking up a, an arrow nodule or whatever you call that, <laughs> uh, all of those little noises are fantastic. So whoever's on your team doing sound, uh, really hats off to them because it makes it so experienced for an audiophile. It's great. Yeah, that's all. Yeah. So the the a lot of the sound asset design is Dave, same same guy who does a lot of the visual design too, which is I think why it, it blends so well together. Um, Funnily enough, I think that that arrow pickup sound is is a splice sample from one of the Sophie uh, music packs. <laughs> oh. um, it's um it's it's just like a like Dave and I love just perusing splice and like listening for stuff that matches kind of the aesthetic that we want. And then our other engineer Chris Lane did all of the actual like, audio programming. And I think the one thing that he does that adds a lot that people don't notice is the uh, spatial audio mix is, is super well done. It's all done in ambisonics. And so the uh, the presence you feel, like, like even just kind of knowing, like if you close your eyes, you can position almost everyone on the field who's talking. Um, he's done a lot of work to tweak that and it's it's designed to, and he did the same, he did, he did it for half and half as well. Um, it's really designed to be as close to the real world as you can get. Like even, um, uh, like if I were to face away from you right now, my voice would be a little bit muffled from, from my head occluding it. Um, his, uh, audio engine in, in VR does the same thing. It's, there's a lot of little cues that just make it easier for your brain to, to listen to everything. And he did like the crowd sounds are all ambisonic, which added a ton of energy to the game. Like, um, even, um, the, my favorite thing actually is just, he did the, uh, the bow pullback sounds and it's scaled based on like how fast you pull it back and how far you're pulling back. Like it, it, the moment we got that in there, it was like night and day. The bow just feels like a real, a real thing now. That's awesome. That's day and awesome. night, day so, and night. Different with one, other games that don't, that don't consider that stuff. I mean, it feels such high quality audio design and that's what stood out to me about half and half as well. So I'm so glad that's in there and we'll be there, I'm sure for your future projects. Oh yeah. <laughs> So, so one last thing that I'm super intrigued by, and I haven't seen many games do this, is you show how many players are online and how many players are playing the game. Like you have some multiplayer titles who are pretty much dead and they just <laughs> act like they're, they're still getting played. So you're trying to find someone. And also with a lot of VR games, it has its ups and downs. But I'm surprised that you just kind of give away this data to everyone who's interested in it. Like what's the reason behind doing that? Yeah, so so originally, it, it all stems from half and half. So when we launched half and half, the very first version, you could go to a door and and start matchmaking, but and it would tell you how many people it had found, but it wouldn't tell you how many people are waiting. It wouldn't tell you how many people are online. And the thing that was like really unsettling about it is, if you waited for a minute, you couldn't tell if you were just the only one in the world playing this game or not. <laughs> and um, and so a lot of it was like, okay, let's let's first just show how many people are online. If there's no one online, like I'd rather you just know so you don't waste your time and then hate the game. And if there are people online, at least gives you some like confidence that if you wait a little bit, someone is going to come along. And even on, in half an app for the door is just showing uh, how many people are, are there. Like it really helps because you can be like, oh, cool, there's three people waiting for a game of hide and seek. Like I'll just go be the fourth. Um, so that's that's where a lot of it stemmed from originally. And I think in uh, in knock it was a similar thing. I think. There's there's still a little bit of, of of iteration I want to do on it, but part of it was also so you could just see you know how many people are waiting for the different modes and things like that. 
Um, but also, I mean, it's uh, it's funny because now there's so many players, it doesn't really matter. You can always get a match, and it's pretty quick. Mm-hmm. But I think before launch, we just didn't know. You know, maybe there would maybe there would be like 50 people online, and and all of them would be in a game, so you'd have to wait a few minutes before getting a game. And we wanted to just encourage people to wait a little bit just in case, because I think that um, if they wait, for, you know, 30 seconds can feel like an eternity if you just have no idea if you're going to get a match. And if you wait those yeah. 30 seconds and leave then there's just even less people to match in the game. So, um, so yeah, yeah. That, that's the main motivation for but it. But it has, like, there's zero loading screen. So even if you're waiting, you could just play a game. So you can always mm-hmm. play. Oh, yeah, yeah. So you can just practice while you're waiting. Yeah. When, and that was, a, that was also, like, a, a very last-minute addition because we're like, man, wait, having to wait with the heads on is brutal. Yeah, but, awesome. um, but if you can play, like, 30 seconds when you're shooting the ball around is nothing. And, and part of the other reason for that is the longer I can... I can wait in the matchmaker, the better the match I can get. And so a lot of it was just trying to be like, okay, how do we make people okay with waiting? Because like the difference between a waiting 30 seconds or a minute can be pretty significant for, for match quality. That's awesome. Yeah. So what about the, uh, the the future of Knock then? Because, you know, like a lot of people have said, like, you know, the, it's like a, a, an eSport potentially. Are you going to sort of embrace that and sort of maybe like do like hosted tournaments and plan events uh, around the game? Only if you can participate and win every single one of them, right? <laughs> yeah, he wins himself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. I award virtual myself cameras. the medal. Yeah, as, as like virtual cameras and stuff like that. You know, yeah. like we've seen in Onward and other competitive uh, games in the past. Like, is, is that something on your roadmap or is it is it just yeah. like... What what's the immediate sort of plans? Yeah, so the I mean, step one is is for us was just get the game out and see if the mechanics good and if people really enjoy, but if it really feels good as a sport, and I think that's definitely proven true. And so now, the roadmap is is, is pretty much all of the above. I think um, we wanna we wanna finish all the cosmetics, like all the things that'll add some 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 like value to the game. Um, yeah, PC or... or something like that, you know, like, like oh, stuff oh my God. Like that. I, I'm the thing I'm dying for is slow motion replays. Like, I yeah. think just like I've made some Ooh. goals where I'm like, oh, man, watching this in slow motion be huge. That one technically is, is pretty difficult. So I get that one might might take us a while. But uh, in the shorter term, I think, yeah, we're looking at cosmetics. We want to do a PC VR version that's got tools for streamers and uh, um, and anyone who wants to play competitively. Uh, I've been talking to a few different different organizations about about like designating one as an official league because i think we definitely want to do official tournaments and things like that um just about everyone who actually i'm kind of curious basically basically everyone who's who's come to me has been like yo vrml you guys should do should part with vrml but is there are there any any like i guess like who do you all think is, is should be like an official league for for a title like this You've also got Val. Uh, you know, we've worked yeah, with them in the Val's past, the Virtual Athletics League. Uh, yeah, the VRML is kind of like one of the most popular ones. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, you could also just host it yourself, you know, like as something. But I suppose if you want them to run commentary and, and the streams, um, then that's probably best to offload it to them. Um, yeah, it, it does. It, VMR, yeah, it does. VRML commentary is, is yeah. really solid, um, mm, no yeah. matter the game. Like they're. For commentators, we've we've had some of them on Alex and, and, and others, for yeah, example, yeah, just to really people. they make a, a great broadcast, like you mm-hmm. were watching a game of sports, you know, or hockey match or yeah, something. That's exactly so that's, what that's, I want. That's why I would say with the logistics, they're they're good at that too. Amazing. Yeah. yeah, in the alpha we held a tournament actually. We 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 got a, uh we asked everyone to sign up. We got I think about like 10, 15, 16 people. And I, in a Google doc, pulled everyone's rank and, and handmade the matches. So they'd all be fair. Like it was, it was a two V two and I set up the teams So like they'd all be fair teams. And, um, and it was funny cause, uh, yeah, Crow, I think got out pretty early. Funnily, I mean, he was the best. So he got paired with like, I think the newest player in the alpha actually. But, um, <laughs> oh man, I is... hate it. And you're like good at the game and you get punished the entire time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, Max, um... you, need, you need to, you need to send Crow this episode because you're going to blow his ego like right up. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I mean, I, I talk about this in like in our alpha discord or I did in our alpha discord and, and he, he just does not have an ego about it. It's pretty wild. I am, um, or he's very humble anyway, but um but uh, in that tournament, yeah, so he got out early. And it was funny because someone was like, yo, I'm going to just cast to the Discord, like, video stream. And so we all just sat in, like, everyone just started, like, if they got out or it wasn't their turn to play, everyone would just hop into that channel and listen to Crow and me just talking about the game. And uh, and it, it w- I, think, I think that's exactly what I want in a league is just, I think it's going to be, if you've got a play- players who are good at the game commenting on, like, the moves and the strategy, it's, 
it works really well for for Knox kind of that style that would be kind of like a a cool uh, sort of feature would be to allow players to choose whether to play or to to spectate. Um, and they could be the crowd almost, you know, like oh, I yeah. wonder how many instances of people you could get into a crowd. Wasn't there, it. wait, wasn't there a game that was called like, like this, this uh, jousting game where you had like two players fighting each other and then you had, you could sit in the audience and hold yeah. like a sign and just. Oh, that was you, <laughs> and, you and Rowdy played that. I can't remember yeah. what that was called. It, it yeah. was from the, from, uh, it was jousting VR. Uh, that was how it jousting was. Jousting right. VR. I actually That's don't right. know if that was, was that a full release or was that only like uh it was some kind of Beta demo, game. but uh, yeah, it was just yeah. fun to sit in a crowd and just watch other people like uh, <laughs> destroy each other. Yeah. But like yeah. about like pro players uh, commentating, that's what they do a lot with Onward, right? Uh, you have uh, mm -hmm. Raiderhead as one of the their fixed commentators, who's also a great player. Uh, Viper has commentated there a lot, who's also uh, uh, yeah. on the team himself. So uh, they, they, I, they do, do I do I do think it, kind of I do think esports like VR esports can really use uh, some some fresh wind because I mean like Echo has been one of the main things, mm -hmm. although that hasn't really seen many like mind blowing updates. Then like effective. onward, onward, you know, you do here, but this is just something else, you know, it's, it's something different, something we haven't seen before. And I, I think it's very enjoyable to watch, you know, mm. uh, compared to I think the art style yeah. lends itself really yeah. well to, to, it's easy to, to understand what's happening too, watching. you know, everyone knows mm. soccer, you know, so. Yeah. I really wanted yeah. it to be a sport that even, even if you don't play it, you can enjoy watching it. Like I think. Um, and, and that, that's kind of also why we went with something that has a ball in it. I think that like any sport where you've got a ball and two goals, like everyone pretty much can figure out what's going on and, um, versus like a lot of like first person shooters, things like that. It can be sometimes hard to tell like who to watch or like where, like if, if, if unless you play the game, it can be really hard to spectate. But I think for knock, like, like, I mean, honestly, my, my, all-time goal is to turn it into a sport at the level of something like basketball where you've got players who are celebrities you know it's like i want to figure out who the michael jordan of knock is and just <laughs> have, like you know make them famous give them some custom cosmetics like turn it into something where like when they when they pull some insane move you've never seen before it's just it's just amazing to watch i think that's that's kind of where where i really want to take it i mean i think it'll take a long time but um but that's sort of like the north the north star You've, yeah. you've also got, I mean, having seen other uh, other titles come in and kind of position themselves early, but then have, let's say, the the bigger name come over and, and kind of uh, knock them out, so to speak. I saw it in <laughs> poker. I saw it in a few other things um, in VR over the last kind of eight years. Uh, but I think you've positioned yourself in a way that knock would be very difficult to compete with, even if Rocket League decided to convert to VR because of your locomotion, because of the things that you learned as you were going through your beta. Um it's in a position now that I think is is quite steady, and I I, I see that future for you. I really do think <laughs> that you could turn this into a sport. So uh, you know, uh, Godspeed on that mission. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so, I mean, I um any any feedback you all have too, I, I'd love to hear it. I think that um there's still a lot a lot like it's it's going to take a lot of work for us to get to that point. I can give you one. <laughs> I gotta say, the, the, I gotta say, the way you handle feedback and the, what you do with it and how you do it is is really impressive. I mean, uh, I've, 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 <laughs> thank you. Like I, I've been giving feedback to so many developers, and sometimes, like like a week before launch, it's already all nailed down. There's yeah. nothing they can do, and then it launches, and I'm like, well, <laughs> good luck yeah, with that. I hope you still <laughs> sell a copy, but uh, you know. So yeah, no, it's I, I think that that's a part of the success for sure. I've and and it's, it's it's something that I, I tried to add really early on. Like, I, I felt that way with Half and Half. We got towards the end, and I was like, cool, the game finally feels somewhat done. And I played it with my friends, and they're like, hey, have you thought about doing this? And I just was not in a mindset to hear it. I was like, cool, I've been working on this for two years. Like, I just want you to tell me that, like, you love my baby. I don't, I don't, I'm not really looking for anything else. Whereas with, with Knock, it was like, I forced us to play test it as early as possible because it's sort of like the longer you work on it before you show it to people – the less you want to change things and and yep. and it, it yeah it's funny because it's it's sort of made it a lot easier i think also the, those first few play tests when people you can kind of tell people just don't think it's fun it's uh it's hard it was really hard i honestly probably the hardest part of the development process but as it gets better then you sort to you sort of like reward yourself for integrate like integrating that feedback and it, it makes it a lot easier you know it's uh yeah like you say it, it was it was so good to see like stuff change like even even up to like 
you know, the, the week before launch uh, from from some of the player feedback that I saw. I think, like Nathie said, it was all for the best. And, you know, I think, you know, you've got a really solid game here and like the, the roadmap plans for the future are super solid. And, you know, I think it, it is viable as a, as a future VI esport. And, uh, you know, I wish you all the best of luck with that. Um, we've got a few uh, questions in the chat as well that have been kind of like dipping in and out throughout our conversation. So some of them are sort of a bit random, just like VR in general stuff. Um, so I'll sort of like say now that if you're interested in checking Knockout, it's available on Quest uh, exclusively right now, but it's what, like $9.99 in US dollars and Quest 2, uh, sorry. Um, but you've got future plans for what PC VR and potentially PSVR 2 in the future as well, maybe? Hopefully. <laughs> maybe. Okay, fingers crossed. Um, so question-wise, uh, like I said, it's a bit sort of outside of the scope of Knock, but uh, we've got one here from Ken Bossack who says, thoughts on VR and NFTs like land or property? Like, what, do you, what are your thoughts on that? That's a great question. I mean, um, conceptually, I think it's something that, that could work. I think that the... Um, I, at the moment, I'm not really big on on a lot of the NFT space, but um, I mean, I have friends who who have done amazing things in it. Um, like Beeple is is a friend of mine, but like, I uh, I like the the concept that you could earn a cosmetic or something in game, and you could trade it for a cosmetic in another game on the blockchain. Like, I think that's I kind of describe it to people like if I could trade you, you know, like a, an Amazon gift card for an Apple one, like they might both be worth a hundred dollars, but maybe it's easier for you to get one or the other. Like I think, like I'm, uh, I'm really good at knock. I can probably unlock some really crazy items. But if I'm gonna go play, or you know, if I'm gonna go into rec room, I could be like, Yo, Nathy, like let me give you this sweet knock. I like I'll trade you this sweet sweet knock cosmetic for, uh, for one of your cosmetics in uh, in rec room. And I think that. That's pretty cool. I think it, it would allow the value of in-game items to extend beyond the games there. And even if you can't really bring the item between games, I think just um, I think that's really interesting to me. But I think it's still very early. I think right now, yeah. when I look at the NFT space, it's a lot of people who are it's a lot of get rich quick type stuff, which is which is is I think once I start to see people who are buying them for real value, you know, like someone's buying it because like, and that's why I really like the in-game item thing. Is like I will. Actually, I, I, there's a funny story about this. Um, uh, so, yeah, big Rocket League fan. Uh, when I was playing in the like a few years ago, they added this goal explosion called Party Time Goal Explosion, and it's just like it's just like balloons and confetti and a bunch of kids going yeah, and it's like yeah. it's funny because like all the other goal explosions are so intense and over the top, and it was just nothing is like funnier than like. You know, so you, you can tell the other team's really tilted and, <laughs> and you're just starting to crush them. And every time you score, it's just like, yeah, and it's like really low key. But um, but that's the only cosmetic I wanted. And it was back when they had loot crates and I'd probably spent like a hundred dollars on keys. Like I had, I'd unlocked, you know, over like over a hundred crates and I just could not get it for whatever reason. And it was it was killing me. It was like it was literally the only item I wanted. And I uh, and at some point I'm in a game and, and someone has it and I'm like. You know, I will trade you anything <laughs> that I've unlocked for this goal explosion. And it wasn't even like particularly rare. Like you'd see it a lot. Like it wasn't it wasn't like the the cosmetic that everyone wanted. And um and so we hop into a party, um, and he's like, Hey yeah, I'll give it to you, I'll give it to you for eight K. And I was like I was like, oh God, I'm not gonna spend eight thousand dollars on this. Like this is uh it, it, dollars. This is, I thought it was like I was like tokens in the like, Rocket League or something. Well so well, so I was sitting there going like no, i I cannot do this. Like I showed him everything in my library, he's like, I don't want any of that stuff. And uh and yeah, no, but that was the mo like there was a moment actually where I realized like, oh, this is a kid and eight K is eight keys, which is eight dollars. And and I was like, I will in a harp, I'll happily do it. And so, like, I, I load up twenty bucks into into Rocket League. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't yeah, like yeah. trade it for a week, so we like wait a week and we come back. And he's like, he's like, dude, I don't know if I can do this. I'm like, I'm like, what? Like, this is, this is like literally the only thing I want. He's like, it's like oh, I just feel really bad. Eight eight keys is a lot. Like like eight dollars is a lot of money. And I was like. In the back of my head, I'm like, you don't realize how much money I've already spent trying to get this item. Like, I, I was like, do not worry about it. I will have, you know, it's it's totally fine. I will like spend the keys on whatever you would like. And um, but for all that to say, like the the in game, like those in game items had a lot of value to me. And I think that, like right now, when you buy NFTs, it I haven't seen one where I'm like, I would buy this because I really want the thing that it represents. But I think for in game items, like they they do have a lot of value to people. And I think in VR. 
phys- like they they have so, so much more physicality. Like I think buying a, like getting a bow as an NFT in VR will feel so much more like you know like owning an object. But um, so we'll see. I mean, I'm I'm kind of keep kind of keeping my eye on it. I don't know if it's something we'll do anytime soon, but um, but I'm kind of waiting for NFTs to have that sort of that similar yeah. value. Because I think right now, like the general gaming community consensus is that that everyone's vehemently against NFTs and gaming. Yeah. But like you say, I think I think it's just because there's so many get rich quick schemes and and cons out there. So much and, trash, yeah. and like you say, well, no one's yeah. buying NFTs to keep them. They seem to just be buying them to flip them and make money. Like and like you say, when it flips on that and people are actually buying it because they want to own something, then things might change. Or whether they've got like some decent utility behind them that's worth keeping. Uh, the 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 mindset will change, but like you say, right now it's still very very early days. Um, yeah, and there's yeah. a lot of big companies who see who see dollar signs and they're like, cool, we're gonna add NFTs, of we'll be able to make a ton of money. I think I think if we ever integrated something like that, it would be purely so people can trade the items. Like I don't think we would use it as an additional revenue mechanism. It would just be so the items are easily tradable outside the game. Yeah, because we've seen examples of um, developers integrating NFTs for like the money, you know, the extra income, like we saw that with Neos and, and now the whole yeah. thing is almost on the verge of collapse because of this alone. Um, and I, I think, you know, adding, like you say, NFTs for the fact that they're free, but you can just, you know, prove digital ownership and maybe you can trade them with other people. They don't really have any value as such. That's kind of got value in itself other than the monetary side, you know, totally. I agree on that. Unique, um, yeah. The unique, interesting. The, the unique characteristic really, um, really sparks up for me, you know, cause like anyone who's dug through like a Diablo chest and gotten a rare item or something. And then you feel yeah. that ownership and you're right, Max, and, and, and the physicality behind it in VR, like it, I, I, when I play Peerhead Arcade and I win, you know, a prize that I've just worked half an hour to kind of get out of a machine and then you own it and it stays on the shelf and when you log back in, it's still there, you know, that's kind of the same deal, you know, but I like the, the, the point you're making about interoperability between different platforms, because to me, the biggest weakness, unfortunately, digital is so broad and we know, you know, the internet is actually only one flavor of the internet. There's, you know, dark net sitting in this corner and there's networks off on that corner. Um, if we're going to have a successful platform for these things, it does have to operate across at least popular bands, some popular networks. So I hope I hope that's a future that, that turns out as, you know, we hope it does. <laughs> um, so another question we'll um, from the group is, uh, from the chat, is uh, PS, uh, PC VR support, you said that that's probably on the cards. Um, if you add additional platforms, will they support cross-platform? Is that that's something that normal people can do? Yeah, so we, we have some early prototypes that can do it. Um, we just need to do some more thorough testing. There's no there's no business reason we would want to turn that off. I know sometimes Sony can can require you to be PlayStation only. I don't I can't really speak to that. But um but uh, yeah, definitely I think I think our goal here is like, you know, VR is still pretty early and so the more players that can play with each other, you know, the better the match is, yeah. the bet the closer the skill rating is gonna be. I think that um Unless, unless maybe the only thing that could block it is we we realize that like players with a certain headset have some insane advantage. But right. at the moment, I mean, we we've we've played between uh, desktop and and Quest Two, and it, it it feels great. Like it it doesn't uh, it doesn't feel like that's going to be the case. So yeah. So hopefully hopefully when it comes to to PC and other platforms, it'll it'll all have interrupt for sure. Awesome, awesome. Um, the other thing I would just wanted to ask you, like, just as kind of a broad VR question is like, what are you most kind of excited about in the VR space, um, at the moment, you know, is it new oh, hardware? Yeah. Is it, is it new tech? And you don't have to be specific about what, what, what platform, but is there a feature like eye tracking or, you know, another feature that you're, you're particularly excited about? Wow. That's such a good question. I feel like usually I've always got a good answer for something like that, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. I um, I've been so heads down and so focused on knock that uh, I haven't really thought too much about what's coming next. I think for us, we were thinking so much about the game being accessible to as many people as possible, and and I really, mm. I really wanted to to support Quest One, but but some of the some of the future plans kind of kind of made it not possible. Right. But um, I I am really curious about the 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 head haptics that Sony announced. I have I've not tried it, so I don't I don't really know what it's like. But but you know you can you can head about the ball and knock right now, and uh, and I think that could be kind of just like a cool detail. The, the other one I'm really curious about is they announced that the the controllers have those force feedback triggers, and I think that pulling back will be really interesting because um 
the the farther you pull back, the more power you get in knock. And right. I think having some kind of physical indication of that will actually allow you to be more precise with the amount of power you use on your shots. Because nice. the the more powerful the shot, the straighter it goes versus kind of kind of arcing and and succumbing to to gravity. But so I think you could um you could develop like a sixth sense for for how powerful the shots are with something like that. And then I think. I'm realizing that I'm just I'm picking all the PlayStation features, but it's it's work. It's not because we're <laughs> we're sponsored by them or anything. But but I'm I also just I'm I'm really excited as a developer about ray tracing. I think that um it just has the I, I don't know if you all saw the video like Nvidia put out a video forever ago where they had added ray tracing to Minecraft. Yeah. And they didn't change yeah. textures. They didn't change anything else. And it just it was literally night and day. Like even there's there's one shot where they're going uh, they're underground. You can see the the red from the lava that's like not even on screen just like warming up the colors of the walls and stuff like i think that um i think that's something that's going to make vr titles feel a lot more realistic they're going to give you a lot more like uh, visual cues about the environment and how things are moving yeah. so those are the things i'm i'm really excited for now but but part of it's also just because i don't really know I don't really know anything else that's coming from from meta i don't really know what's what's come like you know they they showed some cool stuff for cambria but but I, I only know what, what you know what they've announced. Yeah. Um and I feel like the the, the Sony announcements look like it's look, it looks yeah. like it's gonna be a good headset. So I'm I'm really excited for that. Yeah, no totally. Yeah. Headset haptics, head buying the ball and knock, that'd be awesome. <laughs> right. Yeah. Good. <laughs> yeah. It was great chatting to you uh, about knock. I think I I always find it fascinating, you know, like uh, finding out like developers' stories, how they started and how they got on, because I think we all just take it for granted, you know, like, oh yeah, why aren't there all these games? When are these games releasing? Why aren't there more of them? We're always complaining as sort of gamers, but um I, I don't think we'll ever feel satisfied, you know, regardless of how many VR games we get. But it's always interesting to see uh, it from a different perspective so thank you so much for joining us today of course yeah, um, thanks for having me and now we're actually going to dive into a little bit of psvr2 stuff so uh you know feel free to give us your opinion on this stuff um as as we sort of talk about it because you know on, on the last show we we discussed a rumor that was kind of floating around um about the new psvr2 headset which is for the ps5 and that that rumor was that the headset was going to kind of launch um a little bit later than we all expected q1 2023 was the kind of uh, rumor that we heard and this came from brian paul over a, a youtube channel psvr uh, without parole who kind of said that his information came from a credible source and we kind of discussed it on the show and we all kind of I think I don't know if it was just because we all want it to happen this year or we just don't believe that the rumor is true. Um, and we kind of suggested that maybe this is something out of Sony's control, like sort of component shortage or something beyond their original plans to release it this year that, you know, it's had to slip back. But we all kind of still hoped that it was going to be uh, this year uh, or, you know, maybe sort of in the holiday time to sort of hit that Christmas hype. Um, and although we don't know any further information at this point, one sort of interesting thing did come out uh, the last week, and that was from a tech website called Tweak Town. And they'd been doing some like internet sleuthing uh, on United States import records, um, sort of monitoring what kind of Sony have been shipping from Japan to the US. And uh, apparently they were able to sort of deduce that since October 2021, Sony has been regularly sending out shipments of dev kits uh, from Japan to the States. And although it doesn't say exactly what's in the box, it just kind of says development prototype, you know, hardware. Um, everyone's kind of come to the conclusion that it's likely going to be PSVR 2 headsets as when Sony unveiled the images of the headsets just a few weeks ago, they did say actually that headsets are in the hands of developers and they're working on creating games uh, for the headset already. So it kind of put two and two together and kind of makes sense. And and based on that information from the import data, it kind of suggests that there's over 2,000 dev kits that have been shipped since October last year up until this point. And that kind of like gives us a lot of hope in that a lot of devs have sort of, sort of got these in their hands, you know, whether they be making brand new titles for PSVR 2 or whether they're adapting older titles to be compatible, forward compatible with the new hardware. Uh, I think that's kind of reassuring from, from our sort of point of view that, you know, Things are being worked on. Things are happening behind the scenes. Whether it, you know, we may not have like the the release date, the release date set in stone, or or more information on like launch titles, but I just think it's reassuring knowing that there's a lot of these headsets out there in the wild, and devs are kind of working on them. Yeah, I, yeah. I can't comment too much, but I can tell you, yeah, I mean, it's just from just from what Sony's put out publicly, like it's it's definitely something they're investing in, and I think. 
I forget if it was a tweet or something from an executive over there, but I think something that surprised them was how many people continued to use their original PSVR headsets on PlayStation 5. Mm. And, um, and I think that was a big signal to them that, that the even, even though the user base is smaller than obviously all of PlayStation, they're very hardcore fans. And, you know, I'm sure Sony is also aware of how difficult it is to set up that headset. Like, if people are willing to do that, um, I think that's a good sign. But I, I, I know that they're they're heavily investing it. I, I don't really know any details, but I'm 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 glad that I, I think the future will be will be very bright uh, on PlayStation for sure. Yeah. I think I think the fact that you know last week we had a state of play and they said like okay everyone who was waiting for VR stuff it's not coming. Usually we would always watch this right and there would yes. be nothing. And now yeah. suddenly they say it. Uh, how obvious can it get, right? It, they it know people be. are so hyped yeah. for this stuff right now, and they know there is something happening, so they kind of let us. Yeah. Say, I thought that's super funny. People are getting <laughs> yeah. like they, they must be getting like badgered, you know, like every state of play. Like where oh, where is yeah. the PSVR two? Where's the reveal? So they they even gave like you say that disclaimer before the the state yeah, of play. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> that's so long, great I'll, though to see the disclaimer. Yeah, before, totally. Because what I, I wish they I wish we could normalize this as a standard for game announcements. Like, <laughs> because, <laughs> like the VR community is a growing, budding community who's ravenous for more, as Mike was saying. I just wish we could, like, before any game, thing, like, there's no VR news in this, you know? Yeah. <laughs> just save a lot of us a lot of you're, time. You're, you're totally right, because we're so used as VR enthusiasts to be getting kicked around and disappointed. So, you <laughs> yeah, know, yeah. it would be nice just to be told up front. Don't, you know, don't expect anything. But yeah, fingers crossed we get some news uh, soon uh, because we do have some other PSVR news, actually. And um, this is actually from one of Zim's favorite developers. Uh, this is from Cyan because uh, they oh, actually right. confirmed on Twitter this week that their upcoming VR puzzler Firmament uh, will be coming to PSVR 2. Uh, they confirmed it officially. Um, so that's awesome news. But on the flip side, some oh people might be disappointed because, uh, as some of you might know, this game was actually a Kickstarter campaign for yeah. Um And a lot of people that backed it way back in the day were original PSVR owners, and they were kind of promised that the game was coming to the original PSVR. However, they've kind of changed their tack on that, and they're only going to be releasing the game with PSVR 2 support. So you'll be able to play the game flat on PS4, um, you'll you'll be and then if you want to play it in VR, you have to have PS5 or or P, and PSVR too. Unfortunately, this game has been in the film for a long time as well. Right? Yeah, I remember yeah. this the demo too, right, Nathy? Um, I haven't played the demo. I did. Yeah, I, I got to play a, a build of it, but I, it was heavy. Like knowing what I know of all the PSVR titles I've played, I don't think it would run on that on that headset at all. I really don't. On the original PS4, VR, original you mean? PS4, yeah. I don't think. Yeah. On the PS4, I think. I think they they really need to have the new hardware to to run that well because it's going to be a gorgeous looking game. The previous ones were. Um, up, go play Abduction if you're interested, or the more recently uh, re re released Mist version that they released on on Quest. Those are yep. other Cyan games, and just be aware that if you're into puzzles. These aren't these aren't kid puzzles. This, this these are daddy next puzzles. Level, next no, level. You're gonna have to get out a calculator or a piece of paper or a ruler <laughs> or a book. <laughs> a ruler. You Hebrew. You know these are hard puzzles. <laughs> they're, they're very hard. I mean, like, even even me as like a as like someone who loves puzzle games, like Mist was just like, <laughs> what the hell is going on here? Yeah. Um, but yeah, that that's Firmament um, confirmed by Cyan as coming to PSVR 2. And like Nathie said, you know, I, I would imagine we don't have to wait too much longer for a state of play from Sony just to say like, this is this is our plans. You know, I would imagine in the next couple of months at least uh, to give are us we, the heads up. So are we still expecting pre-orders this month? I, I would love it to happen. I would love it to happen at, like during or around GDC. But, you know, who knows? Who knows? Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Um, we're all desperately waiting and, and, <laughs> desperately, and hoping. Desperately, desperately waiting. waiting. Yeah. So he says so. that while he's clocking 50 <laughs> hours in Elden Ring, like he's desperate. Like of crying <laughs> from the inside no. when he says well, that. Well, the thing is, like, if, if, if I was playing some like really, really substantial stuff in VR, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be playing Elden Ring. That, that's my point. And I definitely want to play GT7 in VR even though it's had a rough week with uh, server outages. And I don't know if you heard this, but they also kind of like nerfed the in-game currency a little bit. So oh. to earn the in-game currency in GT7, they kind of like nerfed it a bit. So you have to grind a little bit more. And obviously they've got microtransactions in the game where you can buy in-game currency to buy cars. So it kind of felt like from the community side that they had, they were like, oh yeah, we're going to limit the in-game currency 
earnings from races, but but you can buy our microtransaction yeah, pack where you can get all these like in-game credits. It's like yeah, f you. But um, but yeah, fingers crossed. I still want to play that game in VR. It's a it's a gorgeous game, a GT7. Um, but anyway, so that's that's the only bits of PSVR2 news uh, we've got for you. But hopefully, um, you know, in some future shows, we'll be able to share some more. So. Final thing I want to share this week. This is kind of interesting. Something that I didn't really expect to ever be talking about. Um, but I'm pretty excited about Roblox in VR. <laughs> <laughs> what, Mike yeah. and Roblox? Yeah. Yeah. So so like, so Nathy Rec Room, Mike Roblox, and Rowdy well, Prison Prison Boss, and then Zim is more on the Skyrim. Skyrim. Yeah. Okay. Don't get don't get too excited. Hold your Big horses because this this is this is this is actually pretty interesting. Uh, and uh, to be honest, I didn't even know that you could play Roblox in VR. I didn't even know that was a thing up until no, like you really, this week. You really didn't know. I honestly you didn't play know. play Roblox in VR. Okay. I honestly didn't know. The only thing I knew about Roblox is that my nieces absolutely love it and they play it on their iPads. Okay. And yeah, it, fair it, enough. I've never actually played it. Have I, have, actually, that's a good point. Have any of you guys actually played Roblox? Yes. No. Yes. Have you played yeah. it in VR is the next question. No. <laughs> Once. For not it, long. 20 minutes or 30 minutes. It's quite isn't, blocky. Isn't Roblox in VR? It's like third person VR, right? I have no idea. It's not first yeah, person. It was, I, if I'm remembering, there was a toggle to switch between views, but I remember playing it in third person. Okay. I think I remember being in Roblox once in VR, and I went to this burger restaurant, and all these kids were like working in this burger restaurant. Some of them were customers, and they were just role playing the whole thing. <laughs> the, I, want, wow. I want to start off here because like my kids <clears throat> this year got heavily into Roblox. So just as a translation layer before Mike goes into his yeah, spiel, please. right? Roblox is like a collection of games in a similar way to the way Rec Room is a collection of games. You don't go in to just play paintball or just play basketball. Like there are 70 different types of games. And the thing is they allow like an in-game, again, it's like an in-game currency that's augmented by a paid version of that. So you can go in and so for example, my, my, my daughter loves a game called Feather Family where you go in as a bird and you're nesting with other birds and you're like, it's all like really nice and cute and stuff. But if you want the Phoenix, like maybe you have to buy Robux or whatever and pay for it Robux, or yeah. earn it yeah. by doing some actions in the game to get some in-game currency. So that that kind of whole, the entrepreneurs in us, right, you can look at this and go like, that's a really cool business model. And it's also fun from a game perspective because it's like having a game designer uh, that then based on popularity of your game, your game can float to the surface. Uh, yeah. But it, it it does look very kiddish. Uh, it, but, but on the core game design, level there's a lot of really cool indie projects in there so um yeah. mike tell us what what yeah, happened well, well, to roblox this week <laughs> <laughs> well this is the thing like that that was the, always the image that i got in my mind when i i thought of roblox like these kind of blocky characters and that was as good as it was ever going to get mm -hmm. well I, so i was browsing through reddit some of the vr reddits just like kind of looking for stuff to talk about and, and to to sort of like explore because like you, as we've said on the show it's a kind of a bit of a dry spell at the moment and um and yeah i just happened to find this clip which was posted by this guy who's making a, a VR game in Roblox and he's using the Roblox VR engine. And hopefully uh, Rowdy's going to show some some clips of this. Um, and, and basically it's like a first person shooter that he's uh, developing, uh, a guy called Pop-Tart Noah. Uh, he's got a, kind of got a history of like um, uh, making weapons and stuff in Blender and, and, and sort of doing a sort of 3D model design. And, and basically, yeah, he's developing this first person shooter using the Roblox VR game engine. And uh, it's called Ares VR, and he's kind of describing it as a single-player VR shooter with a Matrix-style storyline. Mm -hmm. so it actually, be like, like the, the 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 view of it reminds me of another Roblox game that is being made, but it's it's a first-person shooter, a flat-screen one, uh, right. where they also are saying like, I can't believe this is actually Roblox. It's the exact same story, just without the VR yeah. element. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, it's, it's ab absolutely mind blowing. Like if you saw this, you would never in a million years think it was made using Roblox. You would think it was like using you know Unreal or Unity or whatever. So, so um, you're saying that the simplistic art style of Roblox confuses people into thinking that the engine is not the capable image, of doing more the than the image that the that yeah. people have of it. I think the Lego yeah. figures. Apparently, According to him, you know, because he's been posting these clips a lot and they've been getting a lot of attention on the VR subreddits and a lot of people like me are going to like, like, how the hell is this VR, like Roblox in VR? Um, but he's saying that, you know, the engine is like 
super underestimated. It's kind of like under the radar at the moment. Not many people are, are really know what the engine is capable of. And he's kind of really leveraging that. And it, like, you know, if you look at some of these clips, you know, these these are sort of really detailed modeled guns and really sort of like ni nice lighting that you're showing in some of these clips as well. Uh, but he's also kind of got this like uh, really interesting UI with the weapon. So if you hold it in your hand, you can kind of run over it and uh, change your kind of like uh, attachments on the fly. And it changes the way the weapon feels and handles in real time. So you don't have to go through a menu or anything like that. Really nice, clean, simple UI. Um, but yeah, he's been working on this for a year already so far. Um, and uh, like I say, it's going to be a full scale game that will be sold through the Roblox, you know. And, and when I had a little look today uh, on the official Roblox store, there's actually tons of VR projects on there already. And like you say, just like Rec Room, these are all like community driven and made projects um, that you can actually sell uh, on Roblox, uh, which I, I didn't even know was a thing. I actually found a clip of, of, the, of the flat game that I was talking about as well that is on, on Roblox. I'll just show it as some, as some background, but that's just also yeah. in, in Roblox. It's, uh, it's pretty amazing, yeah. <laughs> the, the fact that Mike's talking about Roblox here is just the, the most well, entertaining the, the thing, thing I've heard I never, in, in, in ages. I, I, I never, I never thought I would be interested in Roblox VR, but having seen what he's able to achieve with this, yeah, I'm yeah, actually no, really I, interested I, to see where this goes. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah and the, it, the it, Roblox it was kind of, engine's really powerful, and I, th yeah. and I think it kind of gets not necessarily a bad rap, but it's like since since most of the people building with it are kids, like the the quality level doesn't look the same as what you get from professional studios, but uh, but it definitely seems possible. And honestly, I think yeah. the thi the thing that's underrated is that everything's multiplayer by default. Like I think. You know, as someone who who works on multiplayer plugins, like adding that to a game is really hard to do. But if you just don't have to worry about it, and it's a, it's a first party feature in the engine, it's it. I think it's I think it's going to be huge. I think Roblox is going to be absolutely massive. Yeah, the how much time until we have I... knock in Roblox is my question. <laughs> it's going. Sorry, what? I uh, said, so how much time before we're going to see someone recreate knock in Roblox? Because oh, that's what I they'll mean... do. Oh man, I I would I would love that. I would absolutely love that. <laughs> well, well, that's the thing. They so many people are doing that already. Like they're basically creating knockoffs of other VR games in Roblox VR. So we've already got like a Five Nights at Freddy's ripoff in there yeah, already, yeah. amongst many others. Um, so yeah, it's it's really interesting. And I think now just seeing what this engine is capable of, it just kind of like opens up my eyes to think maybe this will be something mm -hmm. legit in the future. It's just kind of like we've just we've just kind of taken it for granted. You know what I mean? That this is something that we might be interested in, but, the, but the maybe problem, it could be. The only problem that I foresee is that, uh, I mean, I just looked it up as well as like, Roblox currently has a rating of uh, everyone 10 and above. But with some mm. of these games that are being recreated, like first person shooters and games that are maybe a little bit more graphical, I'm wondering if that rating is going to change. Uh, yeah. Could well, well just, you know, it will be. Could well be. Also, like you know about Fortnite concerts, right? They've also done them in Roblox. So Right. Yeah, but I, I, I get it. Everyone thinks about that 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 oof guy, that that yellow Lego man yeah. that runs yeah, around yeah. and that's yeah. Roblox in a nutshell, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 But yeah, and so like if you're an audio listener, you know, please like check out Ares VR on Roblox. Just see these little clips and you'll understand why we're kind of like talking about it because it is it's not, you'd never think this was made in Roblox when you see these, <laughs> these, these little clips. This is what I don't understand. Like why hasn't Lego capitalized on VR? I know they, they put out a statement at some stage where they're like, oh, oops, we should have done the Minecraft thing years ago. But I, I feel like they could really build a world, start building a world now, like an ecosystem yeah. similar to mm -hmm. what Rec Room has, but all within the trademarked Lego estate, right? That's With all their assets. Because look they, at all the games they that they put out, like, like the DC that. Universe yeah, Lego, and stuff Lego, like that. Lego Worlds, I think, was the game they made. Like this big sandbox kind of, yeah. And it was good. But I think yeah. people just, Minecraft kind of had already, you know, blocked off that niche. Mm, yeah, true. I just, yeah, I feel like they should. I Plus, feel they like were they, they were really leveraging start. on the AR stuff, like when we saw them with their Lego kits with the AR functionality. So, I still want to get one of those. Any of you guys have picked up one of them? Because I, I haven't well, yet. I remember when I visited San Francisco, like me and Eric Hartley were, were walking around and we went into the Apple store and we saw one of these AR kits and we were like, can you just show us like how this works? And they had like an iPhone set up and it was like, I think it was like a little ghost house. And That's then when you used the iPhone over it, yeah, yeah. like, like Lego ghosts were like flying around. Um, it was really cool. It was really cool. Obviously, you knew that eventually, like the really compelling use case will be when you actually have 
AR glasses, right? And then you you build the kit and stuff starts happening as you build it. Like that's that's the true vision. But right now, sort of using the phone as a window is 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 the only thing we have. Yep. Um, but yeah, super interesting about Roblox. Like I, I just it was completely off my my radar, but now uh, definitely taking a bit more interest in it and seeing. Uh, what could happen potentially in with the future of, of Roblox and VR if, if we get games like this? That'd be pretty sweet. <laughs> yeah. Like you said, like nice. it's kind of like the biggest the biggest comparison is, is Rec Room, right? Because like when you know when we've talked about Rec Room and like Nathy creating stuff in Rec Room, and also apparently like <laughs> whenever I see Sean tweet about Roblox being down, Rec Room sees a huge spike. Yeah. So there's a lot of crossover <laughs> between the audience. It's a very young audience, of course, uh, between Rec Room and Roblox, but. Yeah, I thought it was pretty interesting and worth sharing anyway, worth talking about. So there you go. Nice. You didn't know you was going to get excited about Roblox, that's for sure, when you started the show. <laughs> um, so now it's time to uh, hand over the reins to Zim uh, for this week's top picks of games releasing over the next couple of weeks. And we've actually got a few uh, really cool games coming out. Ah, you yes, should be excited about. I'm actually going to give, um, i got two sections as I normally do, so releases and then um, the, the release highlights and then uh, and then some mentions because there's a whole bunch of things that have kind of trickled in over the last fortnight. Doing doing this show fortnightly means there are things that, you know, we, we just miss and then i gotta, I got to tell you about as well. So some of that too. Sure. All right, let's start off. Um, anyone remember an old LucasArts game called Day of the Tentacle? Oh, I love that game. I love That's that game. Time never travel heard of it. so much. Infuriating time crossing puzzles. <laughs> yeah, he's like, I've never heard of it. I wasn't born when it was released. Yep, probably. <laughs> yeah, probably not. But anyway, uh, this this first one is Tentacular, uh, coming out on Quest and Steam. Uh, March twenty first, twenty fourth is the is the release, and you are a huge tentacled monster. Uh, this game is very different, though, uh, than what it might appear. What, what is on the age rating on this sim? Wait, wait, wait. What is it before I finish this clip? <laughs> like, going down that hole again. <laughs> <laughs> Not those kinds of tentacles. Okay. So, yeah, you can smash stuff and all that. But actually, this game, although it looks like you know you're Godzilla essentially with tentacles and you're smashing up towns, what this game really is is you're a huge, clumsy tentacle monster. And it's actually like a silly, heartfelt, creative game. Something like, if you remember the release of The Vive, Fantastic Contraption, the game where you engineered yes. uh, contraptions. I still want that for Quest and, and other, you know, for like a room scale experience. I'd love to see that. But this is kind of a weird physics game. So you end up getting powers as this tentacled creature, and you learn about your powers and how you can kind of put things together. You'll get certain tools. You discover an alien artifact while you're... Uh, experiencing the game, and you get to meet the citizens of this world. And so you're meant to feel like this kind of awkward, outside the the norm uh, individual, but okay with that while you're interacting with these people and uh, you know dealing with the kind of puzzle elements of the game, going through this upgrade system. So th there's been a whole bunch of uh, kaiju-style VR games where you literally just smash stuff up without much story, without much direction. And this game looks to Different. shake that up. Yeah. So it's very unique. I do recommend if that, what I've just said, sounds good to you, check it out. Um, I certainly will be, I'll definitely be doing a stream on this because this looks amazing to me. Uh, and I hope that the, the, the story spine is enough to kind of give it that little bit of edge. But um, it, it really did harken me back to Fantastic Contraption and that that weird cat creature that you pulled pins out of um, in that game. So. This, this one is being published by Devolver, right? Yeah, Devolver. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's yeah. nice to see them like go back to the VR stuff again. Yeah, I love mm -hmm. their stuff. They have a, they have really great taste. <laughs> I find For weird things you mean. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah Definitely yeah. my my flavor. <laughs> so that was the first one. Um, next up, uh, now <laughs> next up, this is Transformers Beyond Reality. Uh, apparently launching on on the thirty first of March on PSVR. We have quite a few PSVR titles actually. Things are kind of warming up in that space. Um, I don't have many details about this. This was teased about three, four months ago, um, and it has been delayed. It was originally delayed uh, past the end of last year. But from the looks of it, it's a Rails-based shooter in the PSVR universe. I don't really often get my Super Mecha Printatron on, so if any of you are, you know, uh, Transformer fans, uh, you're going to know more about this universe than I do. Uh, I haven't even watched any of the films, so uh, I suppose shame on me. I'm not, I'm not the ultra nerd I should be, but. Um, as I said, from the looks of the video, uh, it looks like one of these um, 
I don't want to say a cash in title, but it looks like it's going to be relatively limited. Uh, a little bit similar feel from the video to kind of Gollum, which we waited a heck of a long time for. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But it gave me a very similar kind of physical vibe to that. Um, again, if you're big into Transformers, um, similar like what we've seen with other things, um, like with Warhammer that we had recently, the, these titles, like they bring the IP, and you can kind of hope that the VR game gives you what you want. <laughs> Generally, they tend to disappoint. So I'm mentioning it mostly because big name title coming in a little bit late. Uh, it is coming to PSVR. So I know, you know, PSVR people are, are as Mike has said, right? We're all chopping at the bit for something new. <laughs> I, I, I would recommend you go check out Moss instead of this. But if you're a Transformer fan, then there you go. That's Yeah, I, I, I'm a big, I'm, I, like, I love Transformers, you know. Um, but when I... When I heard that they were making a VR game, it got me super excited. And then I saw the gameplay and then my excitement dropped significantly. Yeah, yeah um, I'm, I'm, and, and, and the fact that there hasn't been much on the marketing side either, like, I'm a little nervous. Yeah. Let's see. Let's see what the final trailer is. Must, must, must be a cheap IP to grab right now. I don't know. Maybe. They should do know. Beast Transformers. That's what I was into. Oh, wow, yeah. The Beast was, ones? The Beast ones? Yeah. yeah. You never watched yeah, that, Mike? Bootleg, boot, bootleg uh, no, Transformers. It's, it's too new for you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, all, all you kids messing with stuff. Like, just yeah. give me Optimus Prime. You, 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 got, you guys remember Mike talking about, about Optimus Leverin, Prime in you know? that as well, where he was a gorilla instead of a truck. Oh, get oh. lost. He's not a gorilla. <laughs> <laughs> he will always Beast be a truck Wars, in my That's eyes. how it was called, yeah. Right. All I'm right. Just, so was... for anybody who joined us late and missed the intro, I'm going to recover just very briefly. Um, Moss Book 2 is, is launching, so you can see a little bit of... Uh, a little bit of that. Uh, just some really key highlights. If you played the first Moss, you ran around as Quill uh, or supporting Quill uh, from your role uh, as overseer. Uh, new, lush industrial environments, a continuation from the first story. So yes, we get to continue that. It's not standalone in, in that way. There are new enemies. I mentioned earlier, like the bomber, which sets up like a siege tank from StarCraft. You get to work together with Quill, and there's certainly an onus on that this time around, whereas the first time you were mostly you know, moving blocks and things, now you're actually going to be working in combat uh, collaboratively with Quill, uh, defeating Screechers, those old like crab enemies that we saw in the first one, and uh, a plethora of, of new creatures, and also watching out for uh, glowing weapons on statues, because you'll be able to grab some of those. Some new special weapons uh, are there for you in the game, too. So that's Moss. That's landing on March 31st. I feel like that one crept up on us a little bit. Uh, mm. So it's a surprise and, and probably a welcome one to anyone who, you know, has just recently dusted off their PlayStation. Um, there's another one for you to play uh, coming into spring. So with that, uh, a couple of things not to miss from the last fortnight. So first off, um, someone in my chat uh, when I was streaming about a week ago mentioned this to me, and I haven't yet a chance to check it out. But um, if you're into, into free climbing at all, there is an Oculus TV movie being released in two parts called The Soloist. Uh, it features uh, world-renowned climber Alex Honnold uh, mm. on a, a free climbing experience where literally he goes with, you know, no ropes, nothing holding him in. He climbs insane stuff. Uh, there have been many people in the world who've died trying to do things like this. He's 25 years experienced in climbing. You, you, you'd uh, think that that a, would like, you know, you know, make, make him at least think twice about this stuff, right? So, there's people who have <laughs> died day, doing this stuff, so I'm going to do it again. <laughs> like it's his, it's his USP, right? So, I mean, that's that's his unique selling point. He gets to go and climb these things. Um, it's just mad. I, I think I think it's I think it's mental. I have friends who are soloists, and I think it's uh, it's it's a, it's a crazy profession. But one of the things that he was hoping for with this collaboration was that he would be able to bring even his other climber buddies kind of in with him so that they can experience what it's like hanging off the oh. edge of a cliff. So we brought a camera guy, fucking camera guy, Bill, or whoever wait, wait, wait. it was, along Free with him. climbing camera guy as well? I don't think so. I think the camera That's guy was impressive. probably chained in. Um, that would be but, impressive, yeah. It's it's a guy doing I don't it know yet. Hand, I'm going to try it out. One hand. Yeah. <laughs> one hand, yeah. So free climbing, free, two parts, Oculus TV. So go check that out. Uh, that launched on the 3rd of March. Uh, next up, and we mentioned uh, this not too long ago. I know we've had David Hayter on the show from you know Metal Gear Solid's past uh, and who had done some work with uh, a Code Sync title. Uh, but Republic uh, VR, the anniversary edition, is coming to PSVR or came on the 10th of March. And I don't want people to miss it. It's really actually quite long and enjoyable game. I've, I've, I've probably put about five hours in, got past the first chapter in the game, and there were still four more chapters to do. So not a short game by any means. 
but yeah. it's like a it's a thrilling narrative stealth adventure game. Again, very much akin to something like Metal Gear Solid. Um, and it has, and you're basically exploring the perils of government surveillance in this internet age, and you're hoping to keep the main character who you're helping out through hacking through kind of these these cameras and helping her in a third person perspective uh, named Hope. So you're helping to keep Hope alive, as as uh, cliched as that sounds. Uh, th there's a really neat uh, aspect to this, which is that the voice acting in the game, there's a whole bunch of renowned people. So you got Rena Strober from Fire Emblem, Jennifer Hale from Mass Effect. David Hayter, I mentioned, from Metal Gear Solid, and Dwight Schultz from Marvel's Spider-Man. So uh, as you're going through the game, it really does feel like a AAA experience. came out a few years ago, um, but if you haven't uh, played that yet and you have a PSVR, there's another one to keep you busy while you're getting ready for your next PlayStation endeavor. Okay, uh, next up, uh, this one. Um, I know Mike's got a, a shirt on that says, After the Fall. Uh, so don't get confused. This is Until You Fall, uh, which is a Shell Games game. They just came out with a new patch, two-handed weapons update, both on Steam VR and Quest. Now this one is not PSVR, and as far as I can understand from the update, it, I don't think it's coming to PSVR for maybe probably technical reasons. Um, so for anyone who's who's been grumbling over the last couple of updates, if you want something, March seventeenth, Until You Fall came out with two-handed weapon update with some pretty bad ex out of swords and like. Warhammers and stuff in there. So um, that game, heavy into music. Again, it's roguelike, right? You're, you're having to go and go and go again. So if you want something to put yourself into uh, with a bit of music and that does get you physical, much like Knock, right? Um, does get you physical. You can get sweaty for sure in this. Uh, make sure you don't have a, a nice television nearby because you, you don't want to <laughs> knock into that. <laughs> uh, three more quick ones before we wrap this up. Shadow Point uh, landed on March, or is landing on on March twenty second for PSVR. So that one, uh, I always well, mention. Opportunity that. for you oh. to go back and finally finish it, right? So. I'm going to. I'm going to. <laughs> I'm going to for sure. I think I need. I don't know where my save is. It might be on my PC that's still in the UK. So I'm right. <laughs> you should go there. Yeah. But I will, I will, I guarantee you. And I will beat that eventually. <laughs> I keep laughing with the devs every now and often. I'm like, don't ping me. I, you keep reminding me that I haven't beaten Shadow Point yet. Um, and then Stride is out on PSVR March 23rd. And uh, Mike tuned me into this one for fans of Phasmophobia. There are uh, improvements that have been hinted at and coming, and I'll mention a few things. So they're they're actually doing kind of a refurbishment uh, for VR of this. I remember years ago when the Subnautica devs, I'm going to call them out for a second, they said they were going to do a refurb on VR, VR support, and then they never feckin' did it, did they? <laughs> they dropped that like hot tamale sauce. Um, not very good. Uh, but improved hand pos positioning, better item placements on your hips, new hover icons and poses, uh, a grab UI selection, more interaction uh, poses for your hands, and a seated mode and simulated crouch mode if you're a feckin' lazy fecker. All right, so <laughs> now they have that if you don't actually want to crawl around and get scared by ghosts. But Phasmophobia uh, was a cult hit last year, and it, it really has still got a, a good following um, for VR, for streamers, and stuff like that. It's a good, good, good scary game. Uh, so go check it out if you haven't yet. That's it for releases this week. And I'll just recap on the first three that I mentioned in case you missed them. Ten Tentacular, the Spectacular is the first one. Transformers Beyond Reality, which is probably beyond any of our interest in reality. And then Lost Book 2, which we can tell Mike is terribly excited about. And I, could, I feel like he's got a virtual quill already on his shoulder, just poking him, telling him, <laughs> play the game. Play it. Play it now. I hope you, you get a, phys a physical quill this time because I missed out the first time on getting a physical quill. You mean like quill. they were showing up at like a cons, they'd like hide miniature yeah. quills somewhere? Yeah. yeah, and they were like this, the most adorable little figures ever. So I'm I'm hoping that I'll get a little I think I think too. they made a new one for this game as well. They did, yeah. yeah so something. they shared it on their Twitter and I was like, I need this in my life. I will protect her at all costs. Yeah. Um, the other game, is Com Cosmonious High coming as well? It is. I didn't I didn't put it in the lineup. I, I, I cut it, but I think it a was... Little mention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it, I think it dropped. Actually, this this is a mention sorry, for yeah. uh, Project Jamesify. Uh, Cosmo Cosmonius High is coming <laughs> to the channel. You're going to be playing this game oh, for the next wow. six years, so uh, <laughs> enjoy, my friend. Um, yeah, no, awesome, awesome summary of the releases, and thank yeah. you, dude. Isn't it um, funny that everything kind of releases again in the same like? Why does no one spread things out, please? And now we have to <laughs> wait for a few weeks, and there's nothing. Yeah, we can okay. we can direct this question to uh, to our veteran here, Max. A, a yeah. question. From the developer perspective, when you're looking to set a release date, like what guidance are you are you getting strong armed to a particular date? Is it mostly up to you? I'm just curious. We don't often have devs on the on the show. It's yeah. been a little while, so. So with with Oculus and the Quest Store, they set the date. 
so we usually say we usually say hey you know here's roughly when we want it ready um obviously everyone's going hey can we come out right before the holidays <laughs> and, uh, and everyone's like no but um but usually we'll say hey yeah we'd love to do <clears throat> you know january or february or something and they'll they they work closely with the store team so i know that that the reason they choose specific dates is they're collaborating collaborating with the store team on like making sure they can feature everything and i think they want to give every title as much time to like live on the store and be like the new shiny thing um mm-hmm. and so uh but i don't actually have much insight into how the store team determines that stuff but uh, at least for quest it's it's very very heavily driven by oculus it seems awesome. so weird yeah. because like from our perspective it feels like they just throw it at the wall and then yeah. just like make, like uh, make up oh, a random so, number. Okay. <laughs> Let me think. Okay, so we got Zenith coming and the Wanderer. Hey, you know what? Let's just release them on the release same them on day. Release them on the same day. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, tomorrow. I, I, think they've work. Done, um, I think they've done a lot of analytics around that, and I think like they were telling us that I think like Thursdays are the best days for releases, and I think that um, I, I'm pretty I sure they have a bad a data analytics nothing. team. Like, <laughs> oh no! <laughs> <laughs> like if they I release mean, I, a game, the, and the analytics say that we need to release it on the same day. Like. <laughs> All three games on the same day. <laughs> it might, it might be yeah. true. You know, human behavior is really weird. Like sometimes you're like, oh, I'm browsing the store. I'll buy that game. And you're still in kind of wallet spending mode. So I'll buy the next game if yeah, I didn't like yeah, the first yeah. one. So it knows. might be true. I mean, I, I, I think, that, there's, I think there is some of that. Like, like they all launch, you buy the one that you're into. And then there's nothing for a few weeks. So you go, well, I, you know, maybe I'll check this one out. And then, and you, and I think maybe it's, I, I'm, that's me just speculating. I don't, I don't know if yeah, there's any truth to that, but, um, but they, uh, in, like, like we have a, a producer, a producer we work with at Oculus, and uh, and they kind of like they bring, they filter some of that information down to us. But um, but yeah, they they did say you know things like Thursdays are are the best day, and uh, right. um, I but I, I don't know, I don't know how they know that or what they're measuring. But um, sure. but they, I think they have a lot of data. So so not could have just been released uh, together with GTA San Andreas, no problem. <laughs> but definitely on a Thursday. I, 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 I mean, <laughs> on a Thursday. <laughs> that um, I think they, they definitely are thinking about that too. Like I think when they're putting all the titles together, they're looking like, okay, you know, are are these all going to appeal to different demographics? You know, we'll right. put them a lot on the same day. I think I think they are very careful about it. But um, but we're we're as a developer, you know, we're not in the room when they're when they're making those decisions. Yeah. Sure. Cool. Yeah. Interesting insight. Um, so let's uh, sort of wrap up the show. Uh, if you've got any burning questions, now's the time uh, before we say goodbye. So I just want to say thanks again to all of you that have tuned in live. Uh, we really appreciate it. And thanks to all the super chats throughout the show as well. We do notice them. Uh, if we've not mentioned and called them out individually, we do really appreciate the ongoing support. Also, shout out to our audio listeners. Uh, I actually listened to the podcast back on the train to London the other day. And uh, it was really interesting to listen to it back because I don't do it very often now that I'm not traveling much. From the um, last one where you were like talking about labyrinth, I just had it to. It was so funny when you asked about it's... like uh, yeah. when you asked about like if a worm can wear, how does a worm wear a scarf? I just had me <laughs> cracking up on the train. People thought I was a crazy man. So yeah, the audio version is great. So if you're out and about doing stuff, you can listen to the audio version. It's available on iTunes and Spotify. Uh, it's also available on SoundCloud. Also, thanks again to Max for joining us uh, on the show. Thanks talking for having about me. Knock. Uh, and normal core it's always fascinating to get a look behind the scenes of how these games actually uh, get to our headsets so thanks again for joining us uh, just a little reminder of the show times uh, the show is live streamed every other saturday now and that's on youtube and twitch although is the twitch working now i'm never sure i, I, I think it is i mean oh we think we think it is Great. hello twitch uh, how are yeah. you Thanks, thanks to the one person that watches us on Twitch. We really love you too. Um, the, the show goes live at 7 p.m. in Europe, oh 6 p.m. in the UK, and 10 a.m. Pacific time. You can also check out the audio version, like I said. Hit the like button if you enjoyed the stream and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss all our future shows. Uh, I'm not going to be around on the next show, which is episode 199, but I will be back for episode, episode 200, and maybe we can try and figure out something cool to do in the meantime Ooh, to celebrate yeah. that milestone, because 200 episodes is a friggin' lot of episodes. Personal uh, meet and greet with Mike in maybe. Roblox. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll <brainstorm> maybe. <laughs> maybe. Um, no questions in the chat. Everyone's just saying thank you. So yeah, we love you all, and uh, we're going to say goodbye. So take care of yourselves. Have a good couple of weeks, and uh, these lads will see you then. I won't. Bye-bye. I'll see you in a month. <laughs> Bye. Cool. Thanks Bye. for having me. Talk to y'all later. Bye. Bye.